just a heads up to everyone that you know this workshop is being recorded for those who can't be here. Um, so wanted to give everyone indication that that is happening. Um, but welcome. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, welcome to the ninth annual school recycling workshop. This is our fourth time doing this virtually. Uh, for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I'm Ali Vandercook. I'm our Dakota County School Recycling Program Coordinator. I'm so happy you're here today. Uh, the goal of our workshop is to provide creative solutions and resources to assist schools in reducing waste and improving recycling programs. So for our workshop today, we're going to kick off learning about state recycling updates and successful food scraps collection. And then later we're going to learn about bagless recycling, vape device disposal, and school recycling resources. So we're going to have an interactive discussion period in about an hour as a part of the composting education session, but not a specific breakout session this year, but definitely encourage you to stretch your legs when needed, do what you need to do to stay engaged. Um, because it is three hours of continuing education um, units have been approved uh, from both the Minnesota Board of School Administrators as well as the Minnesota School Nutrition, Nutrition Association if you need those. Um, so I've been asked to verify attendance at some point. So I might at a certain point in the workshop take a virtual tally of um, who's in the virtual room space and then happily email you those certificates um, if you need them following the workshop. You can see our agenda here on this slide. I've adjusted it slightly to go until 1135 as the introductions don't count for the continuing education credits. And I wanna make sure that's not an issue for anyone. Um, we'll be recording this workshop as I mentioned and the recording as well as all our presentation slides will be shared on our webpage. Uh, so if you're wondering, you don't need to be taking the screenshots but if that's helpful to you, go ahead too. Um, but it's nice to know that they'll be available to you. After each speaker, we will take a few questions. We'll also have time for questions during the Q&A section after our first um, panel with our successful food scraps collection. If there's additional questions we don't have time for, each presenter's contact information um, is available to you um, so you can reach out to learn more. I've also asked uh, everyone when they were registering if they'd be interested in recycling and organics facility tour and I know more than half of us were so I'm going to be sending out two dates to be able to attend the tour um, later this summer they'll take place before school starts on two separate weeks so we can hopefully if you're not able to make one tour you can make the other one if you were interested so look for more information on a follow-up email regarding that and I think that's enough talking for me for a second. So my colleague Kirsten's going to um, just be assisting us today. We met her this morning probably already um, with compiling questions and the technical side of things. So she's gonna briefly explain some Zoom meeting reminders and tips. Hi everyone. If you haven't already heard from me, I'm Kirsten. I work with Ali at Dakota County. Um, so as Ali said, I'm helping out with a tech. I'll be watching the chat. Um, and hopefully um, helping out on the back end. So just some quick Zoom reminders if you're unfamiliar. <clears throat> um, we are muting everybody when they sign in. If you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself, but we prefer that you enter your questions into the chat. Where is your chat? It's on the bottom portion of your screen, on that first purple arrow. Um, you can just select the chat. You can type a question in, hit enter, and then that will go to everybody in the room. You can also send individual chats. So if you want to say something to me specifically or to Allie, you can even select the participant that you want to send a message to. Um, but we really do want to focus in on the content here today that we're hearing at the School of Recycling Workshop. You know, you signed up, you um, took this time to learn something new. So hopefully you can limit your distractions. I know it's hard to not look at your cell phone while you're, you know, trying to learn something new. Virtual is, um, can be tricky, but uh, we have a lot of really great content here for you today. Um, so if you really like what somebody has said, you can react. Um, and this is just kind of fun, an added benefit of Zoom. You can um, select on that second purple arrow, there's a reactions tab. And so you can um, do a little clapping emoji, yay, or thumbs up if you hear somebody or, you know, celebrate. It's just another fun way to interact. 
So um, I think that that is most of the quick Zoom overview. Again, um, questions in the chat, and um, I'm here to help answer questions if you um, don't want to unmute yourselves. So thank you. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Kirsten. So we're going to take a quick practice poll because we have a few polls throughout our workshop today. So we'll do a quick one so we can all see how it works. So um, we're going to pull that up for you and you should see it pop up on your screen in a few seconds. And it's just kind of a fun question. What superpower do you wish you had? All right, people are answering. Responses are coming. Yep, Do riveting. This is riveting stuff. <laughs> Jillian Ooh, says, it looks like talking to animals. <laughs> or yeah, I like that. Back, maybe if you have another idea, putting it in the chat. Yep. All right. Sixty-one of seventy-six. So we can give another five seconds. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> Awesome. All right, ready? I think we're good. All right. Let's see what we got. All right. So it looks like on my end here that time travel has taken mm. taken the prize. So yes. now we know how to now we know how to do our polls. So we're ready for all the polls throughout. Um, it's just another way to kind of stay engaged throughout the workshop. Um, so with that, um, we're going to get started on our first presentation. So we have our first speaker today, uh, Peter Santai. Uh, Peter is a principal planner at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, Agency. He's been in the solid waste field for 17 years. He has a master's degree from the University of Kansas and a bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota Duluth. His primary focus is waste planning in the Twin Cities metro area, Hauler reporting, landfill certificate of need, and waste to energy policy. Peter's passionate about moving waste to its highest and best use. So take it away, Peter. And Peter's going to be sharing his screen. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, just got to make sure I get the right uh, screen shared here. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Great. Well, thanks, Allie and everyone for inviting me to come speak today. Um, one thing that's not in my bio is that uh, public schools are near and dear to my heart. My mom was a third, fourth grade teacher and my dad was a principal. So I come from a, from a family of educators. So I, uh, I love what you are all doing with our children. Um, so just a really quick overview so that I don't waste time because um, I know that there's a lot to get to today going to go over a brief history of how waste has been handled in Minnesota going way back, um, what the role of the state is in managing waste, kind of a picture, a snapshot of what our current waste system looks like in the state of Minnesota and where we want it to go in the future. And then I'll wrap it up by talking about what's the school's role in all of this and uh, why should you care? So, and then I'll wrap it up with some questions. So what is solid waste? Um, seems like an obvious answer, but essentially it's anything that we generate and want to discard that is solid. So not liquids. Um, a lot of people think of solid waste as wastewater, um, what we flush down the toilets. Uh, that's not solid waste, that's wastewater. Um, but solid waste is everything we throw in our trash cans, um, but it also includes things like construction debris, um, and things that are outside of our daily household use. For the purposes of my discussion today, I'm going to talk about municipal solid waste, which is what you deal with at your schools. Um, and then this graphic that I have on the screen really demonstrates where our materials flow when we put them in the bin, because a lot of people don't think about it. So here in the Twin Cities, uh, when we throw something in the garbage can, it either goes to a landfill or it goes to a waste energy facility. Um, and I will get into which is more preferable in a moment. And then obviously if we 
divert our organics materials like food waste or compostable uh, paper products. That's going to go to a compost facility in all likelihood. Um, some food waste goes to uh, hogs. I'm sure some of your school programs have food to hog programs. And then finally, you know, the recycling category goes to a sorting center where they separate those materials into commodities that can be sold to a manufacturer where they make a new product out of that material. So it has an economic value to the system. So way back, um, historically, people dealt with waste by dropping it. Um, and a long time ago, that didn't matter very much because most of the waste that humans generated was organic material and it would decompose in the environment. You know, that orange peel is a good example in the picture. Um, but even then, it's still in large cities, it caused problems, it smelled bad, um, can create health nuisances. Um, so people in the United States, this is fast forwarding quite a bit now, um, started to have city systems where they would collect material and take it away. But even back then, there were still a lot of problems with the way they managed waste. Um, they would cart it to a low-lying area like a gravel quarry or a wetland and dump it there and fill the hole. Um, I don't think I need to surprise any of you here in Minnesota with uh, farms have a history of using burn barrels where they would burn their waste on site. And uh, that creates dioxins in pretty high quantities, which are carcinogenic, uh, deposits on the food that they're growing. Uh, clearly not an ideal situation there. Um, but this is historically how waste was managed in the state of Minnesota. Um, these problems that I highlighted, the carcinogenic issues, the low-lying areas that can create groundwater concerns, um, led the federal government to react in 1965 with the Solid Waste Disposal Act. Um, we don't need to get into too many details around the boring nature of some of the lit litigation, but it was an amendment to the Clean Air Act, um, which was the first federal law to enact clean, environmentally sound methods for disposal of waste. Um, that was shortly followed up by the RICRA Act, um, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which required that hazardous waste had to be handled separately from solid waste. Uh, and that was a really important piece of litigation so that um, we were managing those hazardous materials in a safe manner as well. Which brings us to the state of Minnesota. Um, just drilling down to the agency I work for was created in 1967. Um, and starting in the 1970s, the first solid waste rules were adopted that actually put requirements in place for what we could do with our waste materials. Um, it still kind of blows me away when I look at these dates because that's not that long ago. And um, before that date, we just had open dumping. People just took it out to the back 40 and put it in a ravine. And in 1973, after those rules were adopted, the agency made a big push to transfer from 1,500 open dump sites around the state of Minnesota and were replaced with 140 permitted lined sanitary landfills. And that was a big step in the right direction in terms of environmental quality for protecting groundwater and um, the human health of the residents of Minnesota. In addition to that, what's not on the slide is the state accepted the liability for those open dumps. And we created what's called the closed landfill program. And so Minnesota tax dollars have spent millions of dollars cleaning up these old dump sites and remediating those areas to ensure that that waste is now protective of the environment and human health. So there were some really good things that were done in the 1970s. That leads us to the 1980s Waste Management Act. So this is still the piece of statute that guides my work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it created what we call the Waste Management Hierarchy, which I'll get into a little more detail on the next slide, but it also laid out these five 
key purposes of the way we want to manage waste. And I want to point out that the first one is the reduction in the amount of waste that we generate, but also the toxicity of that waste. Um, and we tend to forget about that one. I think that one's the most important is having less toxic materials generated and less amount of waste. So that's the reduce that we always think of in the three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle. It's right there first and foremost. Second is separation and recovery of materials and energy from the waste. Um, we want to reduce indiscriminate disposal of materials. And then we want to coordinate local political subdivisions so we're working together. And then last but not least is we want orderly development of facilities. In other words, we don't want landfills popping up in every corner of the state. We want to make sure that we are adequately planning our waste infrastructure so that we have the appropriate number of facilities to manage the amount of material that's being generated. Um, because the more, more landfills, the more risk we have in terms of potential um, environmental problems going forward. So that is the same statute that gave us the waste management hierarchy. And we all know the three R's, they're on the left side. Those are the most preferred. And I have to emphasize that we, we get to recycling and we sometimes forget about the first two and they're more preferred than recycling. So recycling's great. I don't think anyone would ever say that recycling's not a good thing for us to be participating in, but anytime we can buy, re, buy used or donate materials for reuse, that's better than recycling. And above and beyond that, anything we can do to reduce the amount of waste generated, um, reusable bags to the grocery store so that we're not generating those plastic or paper bags. Um, things like that make a huge environmental impact in a positive manner by not generating that waste in the first place. Going down to the right, organics recycling is also really valuable. Um, prevents waste, organic material in the landfill creates methane, which is the most one of the more potent greenhouse gases, uh, 10 times more potent than carbon dioxide for greenhouse gas emissions. So we really wanna keep that organic material out of landfills. That's followed by waste energy. Now we're kind of at the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, we do see waste energy as more preferable to landfilling for a number of reasons. There's no legacy impact to a waste energy facility. When that facility is decommissioned, you can simply convert that building to something else and there's no legacy impact on the land. Um, then landfill with gas recovery and then landfilling without gas recovery is the very bottom of the hierarchy. I often joke that there's actually one more and that's illegal disposal in a burn barrel or throwing waste out in the back 40. Um, that's actually the very least preferred because that has even worse consequences to using our permitted facilities. So what's my role in all of this, right? It's, it's a big system, it's complicated. And so the state of Minnesota, we regulate those waste management facilities to make sure they're operating um, in a safe manner. We put solid waste policy out. So in what ways can we improve the ways we're managing waste? What can we do to put policies in place like a bag ban or something like that that will reduce our impact long-term? Um, continue to advance the goals of the hierarchy. A big one is re requiring planning. And uh, I mentioned it er earlier, uh, we have to plan for the types of facilities we need, the amount of waste we anticipate being generated um, so that we have the right infrastructure in place. And then we provide technical financial assistance and achieve goals in partnership with our county partners. Um, this is just a fun graphic that shows our different county planning regions. I'm going to focus on the metro area since that's where you're located. And that's where my focus is. I'm a metro planner. There are slightly different ways in which we plan but in, in greater Minnesota, they follow a planning rule. In the Twin Cities here, we have what's called the Metro Solid Waste Policy Plan that the MPCA writes. And then the seven metro counties have to develop solid waste plans that are consistent with that plan and then implement it. Um, what is that plan? It's a 20 year plan that implements the Waste Management Act. Um, and I talked about how the counties have to then implement 
the objectives of that plan. Uh, we are currently drafting, we have drafted the new plan. It's out on public notice. If you're interested, uh, we're always looking for public input on that plan. Um, and these are the key themes of our current uh, policy plan. I know there's a lot of bright colors here. Um, one of the big ones is environmental justice. We want to make sure we're reducing our burden on disadvantaged communities through the way in which we manage waste. Um, we need to improve our data reliability in solid waste. Uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. I'm sure many of you have used that same uh, language with your students. Um, but for sure in solid waste, if we don't know how much material we're generating or where it's going, we can't really adequately do a good job of making sure it's managed effectively. Sustainable materials management I'll get into later, but essentially that's the concept of maximizing our environmental benefits by managing materials in their best manner. Um, different materials should be managed in different ways and that's probably somewhat intuitive, um, but the best outcome for each material is what we need to look at which is more than just simply that high level hierarchy. Um, aluminum cans, for example, it's actually the best outcome to continue to recycle it because of the environmental benefit of recycling that can over and over again. Um, we aim for regional consistency. We want all seven counties to have as similar programs as possible because the metro area is very complex. Uh, we want to embrace new technology and I'll get to that. And we want the system to be really resilient. Um, we've experienced some things with COVID, um, civil unrest over the last several years. Um, emerald ash borer is killing all of our trees. So there's a lot of wood waste generated. These are things that we continue have, the system has to adapt to to make sure that we're ready for these kinds of problems. And of course, we wanna support that waste management hierarchy that I already talked about. Um, Further complicating things for us is that the waste stream is constantly evolving. And so just a couple examples here in 2000, 34% of the waste stream was recyclable paper. And this is what we're finding in the trash. I wanna be clear about that. This is after we've recycled. Um, so this, these numbers are what are, we're finding when we dig through the garbage and find what's still in there after we have pulled everything out for recycling. Um, in 2013, 25% was paper and the organics went from 26 to 31%. So it's really easy to identify that organics is that big area of opportunity for us to divert material from the waste stream. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a newer waste comp study on a statewide level than 2013. So uh, we're hoping to be able to do one soon and update this data and see if these categories have shifted even further. Um, it's probably not too surprising to all of you that the paper has decreased. You know, it wasn't that long ago that everybody got a daily newspaper, a phone book, and now people get their news on their electronic device, which is a waste reduction um, because all that paper is not being generated. So I want to highlight that even though that's not being recycled, it's a good environmental outcome that we're not generating all that paper anymore. Uh, just want to talk quickly about Dakota County since that's where you're all located. Um, there is a metro wide goal of 75% uh, combined recycling and organics diversion. Uh, Dakota County is doing a great job, um, slightly over 50%. I want to highlight that that 75% goal is very ambitious and may not be possible. Um, so we shouldn't be uh, criticizing them for not being at that level. It's a very uh, very ambitious goal, um, but in my opinion, is still one that we should be striving to achieve. Um, pushing, pushing farther, and this is starting to become more relevant, is these are the top 10 items that we find in the trash. And I want to highlight the top two because you're going to find those at your schools. Food and compostable paper like tissues and napkins um, are the two biggest. Right. And then uh, second and third from the bottom, cardboard and recyclable paper are our top two recyclable items that we're finding in the trash. Um, I mean, not technically, I guess plastic bags and film plastic are recyclable too, but those pose some challenges that we don't need to get into here today. Um, but your 
common curbside recyclables of cardboard and recyclable paper. Um, so can we do better? I think we've already uh, shown that yes, indeed we can. 40% uh, of our current waste can be recycled. Um, there's a lot of material there, a lot of economic opportunity uh, going back to the fact that these recyclable materials are commodities and people want to use that for economic gain. Um, in addition to the environmental impact of making sure that we're managing them more appropriately. I'll just give you a second to take a look at the amount of material that's actually there for these. I won't read the slide to you. So I talked briefly about sustainable materials management, but this is really where the state is focused on going into the future. Um, it's not really a new idea, but it's not the way that the system or the waste professionals have been thinking about solid waste in the past. Um, but we want to manage materials to minimize their environmental impact. Um, it seems obvious, right? And a big part of that is including life cycle assessment in our analysis so we get that full life cycle accounting of a material and its environmental impacts from being a raw material that's being mined or harvested to its use as a product and all the way back to its disposal phase. And it's probably not surprising to any of you that the extraction phase is the phase in which most of the environmental impact for most materials happens. Um, an exception would be like your automobile. The use phase has most of the environmental impact for an automobile. So counterintuitively, it probably makes sense to buy a new car frequently to minimize your environmental impact because the dis disposal of the vehicle and the purchasing and the manufacturing of the vehicle is a tiny percentage of the amount of environmental impact compared to the actual use of driving around the community. So that's what we mean by talking about the life cycle is thinking about all those phases of a product and then making sure that we're managing those materials to the best impact that we can achieve. Um, and so again, I wanna point out that it goes above recycling and composting, which are great things, um, but we really wanna look upstream and think about how we can change how products are manufactured and developed because that's got a huge impact on our environment. Um, beyond that, we're looking at more creative ways on the back end to manage this evolving waste stream. It's challenging to keep up with the way products are developed. Um, a lot of our recycling centers are, are uh, beginning to use robot technology to help sort at their facilities and pull materials more effectively. Um, and those robots are trained with artificial intelligence to recognize different plastic um, codes. So the infrared beam on the, on the robot can more easily discern what type of plastic is coming across the conveyor than any human can. Um, it's just easier for them to be able to see what type of chemical composition is in that plastic and get it sorted appropriately is a good example of why that technology is helpful. Um, obviously, bacteria power, we're talking about, you know, how can we use um, bacteria to maybe break down plastics in the environment as a big piece, but also, you know, how that bacteria is really useful for breaking down organic material like food waste. And finally, anaerobic digestion is a new technology for solid waste. Um, it's been used forever with wastewater treatment plants. So the big pig's eye plant has anaerobic digestion vessels for processing human waste and everything we flush down the toilet. This is applying that same technology to food waste. And there are several companies uh, in the metro area that are looking to develop this capability. Uh, so that's something new that's coming on board. And I wanna th think back to that um, waste hierarchy. There's nothing in there for anaerobic digestion, but you're generating uh, methane gas at an anaerobic digestion facility and capturing it. So is that a waste energy technology? Um, 
or is it more akin to composting recycling, higher on the hierarchy? Those are still decisions around policy that need to be made at the state level. Um, certainly there's interest in having that count toward recycling for that 75% diversion goal. Um, right now, the agency's position on that is that it only counts as recycling if you're actually composting the digestate um, that comes out of the back end of that facility. Um, but again, a lot of that depends on the individual facilities because they all operate in different ways. And we're talking in hypothetical right now because these facilities haven't been constructed yet. So now to shift to schools, why schools? Um, first, is there state law that requires uh, schools to participate in this process? And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but the big one is there's a lot of material generated at schools. I have another slide coming up that I'm going to talk about earlier, I guess, is that you have the opportunity to mold young minds and get that behavior established at a young age. And we see that kids bring those behaviors home and help influence them at home as well. And you're all aware of it, but if kids are recycling at school, they bring it home and then they talk to their parents. Why aren't we recycling here? We should be recycling here. And so it's really that opportunity to get into people at a young age where they're more malleable and get them to accept these behaviors and think about these things at a young age. Um, but beyond that, 80% of the school waste is recyclable or compostable. Um, and then there's a 17% solid waste tax on waste that's generated. So there's a real opportunity to save money if you're diverting that material and putting it into a tax-free bin. So there are good reasons financially too for schools to participate in composting and organics or composting and recycling programs or food to hog is also tax-free. Um, again, I can't emphasize this enough, but reusables are better. We had a big phase change where schools went away from dishwashers and reusable uh, trays and silverware to the compostable products and disposal. And some of you may have seen that shift at your schools. We do have a bit of a trend shifting back. I think in a lot of ways that was a decision made to save money on staffing so you don't have somebody that has to wash all those dishes. Um, but it's definitely a better environmental outcome if we have reusable trays, reusable silverware um, that can be washed on a daily basis and reused. Um, certainly that's the system I knew as a kid and many of you probably did as well. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a huge environmental benefit as shown in this graph in terms of GHG, water, uh, air emissions, all of those things. It's, it's a big difference to use reusables as opposed to disposable. And that's just utensils here on this graph. Um, I think you all know that the custodial staff are the keys to the success. Um, having good buy-in from your custodial staff, making sure that these um, containers are properly managed and sorted is absolutely critical to the success at schools. Um, but the other one is food waste reduction. Um, giving kids the choice to a certain extent to pass on things that um, that they don't want to eat so it doesn't end up immediately in a disposal bin makes a lot of sense. And I know there's requirements um, through the Department of Health that require that kids have to be offered certain foods. Um, but if they're not eating them anyway, uh, what's the point in discarding it at the end of the day? So, um, and then of course I talked about this, but we want to create the next generation of recycling and composting experts. And schools are perfectly positioned to do that through small changes. Um, so with that, I'm wrapping up and I hope that I haven't bored you too much and have generated some good questions. Yes, thank you, Peter. Appreciate that presentation. And yeah, we are opening it up for questions now. So if anyone does have a question, feel free to throw it in the chat or if you'd rather unmute yourself and ask it that way, that works for us too. 
one other thing that I'll throw out there is my contact information is on the screen. So feel free to write it down and reach out to me directly. Um, I'm always willing to speak to schools or teachers, um, classes, if that's of interest. Great. Linda, did I see your hand raised? Maybe that was an accident. Any questions for Peter? Hi, Allie, it's Kim. I have a question mm -hmm. about the slide where Peter, where you showed 31% um, organic. So is a slide from 2000 and a slide from 2013. I didn't catch what the 26% other was. Maybe you said it, maybe you didn't. Oh, I didn't, but most of that's uh, garbage. So just your mm -hmm. general waste. These are the big categories. Although some of the other in this situation is uh, recyclable metals. Um, but just smaller percentages of those materials. Okay, that's what I thought, but just wanted to be clear, thanks. Yep, good question. And I think that slide's interesting too to see, like you said, materials are changing over time, less paper, but more plastic. <laughs> like just right. more plastic is happening. And it's by weight. And we all know how lightweight mm -hmm. plastic is. So mm -hmm. when you look at this by volume, that's a massive volume change. Mm -hmm. This paper is pretty heavy. Hmm. Any other questions for Peter? I know I've gotten a few questions in the past from schools of, mm -hmm. um, you know, if if a material is collected as recycling um, and it's source separated as recycling, put in the recycling dumpster. Is it allowable to bring that anywhere but the recycling facility? Good question, uh, <laughs> Allie. There's a state law against that. So you can't dispose of source separated recyclables. It has to go to a permitted recycling facility where it can be collected and um, turned into a manufactured product. Uh, we have had a few examples of uh, violations to that statute and the agency follows up on those complaints when we find out about them. Yeah, I think that's great to know that in Minnesota, it is illegal once something, you know, is collected as recycling to bring it yep. anywhere but the recycling facility because I, I get questions on that too of, is our recycling actually being recycled? So it's really great to know that we have people like Peter and the state who are making sure that that's happening. I don't know if any of you have been to our building at the state fair, um, but they always have mm -hmm. a pretty interesting display of local Minnesota businesses that manufacture products out of recyclable material. Um, and because we do have experience. quite a few, yeah, we have quite a few manufacturers here in the state that manufacture products out of our curbside recyclables, which is pretty cool. A lot of plastic lumber companies uh, by the yard is a good example where they do the plastic furniture. Great. Well, thanks so much, Peter. Thank you for your time. Yeah, happy to be here. Oh, there's a question from Kirsten. Maybe? I think that might have been a high five. That was my oh. bad. I was trying to clap. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Great. Okay. So, thanks much. uh, Yes, thank you so much, Peter. Um, next, we are going to jump into our successful food scraps collection. And in our initial agenda that went out, I was going to talk first, um, but I see Jake is here. And so Jake, if you're willing to go first, uh, I can introduce you as you're pulling up your slides. Uh, and I will start by saying Jake um, Duwami holds a bachelor's in waste management from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. In his role as director of organics development for specialized environmental technologies, one of the largest composters in the Midwest, Jake oversees quality control and environmental compliance at all SET composting sites, including the organics processing facility in Rosemount, Minnesota. He also manages the compost sampling and analysis program, coordinates with regional organics recycling stakeholders, and provides ongoing outreach and education to municipal partners, organic waste generators, um, haulers, and the public. So thanks for being here, Jake. 
And I see you have your slides up, so take it away. Thank you, Allie. And it's, it's Duane. I should have probably uh, spelt that out phonetically <laughs> in my bio. <laughs> I, I really went for it there, but yeah, yeah, it's okay. I knew I was probably missing the mark. No, no, that's quite all right. <laughs> well, thank you, Allie. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, showing up for this workshop. Um, a lot of great work the county is doing to put it on, so I appreciate being able to present to you on uh, commercial composting and organics recycling and some of the issues that we face um, as a processor of organic waste. So a little bit of background uh, about company uh, specialized environmental technologies. Um, up until March 1st, uh, 2023, we're a privately owned um, local composting company. Um, on March 1st, WM, formerly Waste Management, purchased SET. So we are now a uh, WM subsidiary, uh, but there are four local composting sites that we operate, uh, three of which are yard waste only sites. So your grass, leaves, um, brush, tree branches, and that type of material uh, go to three um, yard waste composting sites. And then we operate the Empire uh, slash Rosemont processing facility uh, where we take in food scraps for composting. Um, we have Member, we're members of the U.S. Composting Council, along with the Minnesota Composting Council. We have an active board member on the MNCC. Um, and then just to give you an idea of the scope of our operations, we process around a quarter million cubic yards of yard waste materials and about 20,000 tons annually of uh, source separated organics, so food scraps and compostable products. Uh, and that number, um, you know, it's continually uh, trending upwards as more and more programs come online um, to um, participate in organics recycling. In between those feedstocks, we generate around 100,000 cubic yards of finished compost um, that is sold annually throughout the community. So one of the main issues that we um, deal with is uh, contamination in the organics recycling. Uh, contamination meaning any non-acceptable material uh, or non-compostable material that enters the organics waste stream um, that inevitably will not break down in the composting process and uh, leads to uh, what we refer to as a residual rate, um, which is not only a burden on the composter that processes the material uh, cost-wise, but also uh, negatively impacts the finished compost product that we uh, need to sell to be a viable company. Um, so one thing that we do is regularly review and update our acceptable materials list um, to make sure we're synchronized uh, with all of the other composters in the state, as well as um, uh, you know, harmonizing that list with uh, regional uh, and local waste haulers, the environmental staff from the cities, uh, counties, and state, um, and any other key stakeholders that participate in organics recycling, um, either on the front or the back end. Um, so as it stands now, we are permitted and able and willing to accept any and all food scrap materials. Um, that includes meat and bones and dairy products, things that you wouldn't necessarily want in your backyard composting piles. Um, way we process material heats it up enough to um, to kill off any potential pathogens or uh, or any bacteria that could cause human or environmental problems. We are also able to process uncoated paper products, so things like napkins and paper towels, uh, pizza boxes as well, um, and then any certified compostable products uh, that's been certified through the Biodegradable Products Institute and BPI. Uh, they're a key partner to the composting industry to ensure that the products that they certify will in fact break down in the composting process. And then we'll offer that education up freely to anybody willing to listen. Uh, so haulers, uh, waste haulers that are out there collecting all the material, the generators that are producing it, making sure everybody is on the same page about what goes in the uh, organics recycling bin. Uh, and what BPI does uh, as far as certifying compostable products is they'll ensure that a product is gonna break down uh, yielding no more than water, carbon dioxide and biomass. 
Um, two, that it's going to break down at a rate known, uh, similar to other known compostable materials. Uh, so it's you know, breaking down as fast or faster than stuff that we already know will break down, such as the food and yard waste materials. Otherwise, it would just get screened out and it wouldn't serve a purpose if it took you know, years for it to break down. And then that it does, uh, as it breaks down, it's not causing any unnecessary harm to the environment through uh, toxic potential residues or uh, negatively impacting the quality of finished compost with, um, with residual materials being filtered through. And then uh, BPI also requires the use of their logo, and that's really key for identifying compostable products. Uh, if there isn't a logo on a product itself, then we have no way of knowing that it's a compostable product. And uh, you know, to play it safe, we'd have to assume that it's a contaminant and then um, deal with it accordingly. Uh, I do see a few questions popping up. Um, should I field those now or uh, wait till the end, Ali? I know I'm uh, limited on time. Yeah, we'll wait until the end. So keep going unless Lovely. you feel like something's imperative to answer. Well, I'm not reading them. I just see the number popping up. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get them to you. Thanks, Jake. Okay, thank you. So another thing that we do that we do at our site to um, minimize the potential impact of contamination is inspect all the incoming loads of organics, um, ensuring that they're um, suitable for processing. Uh, and this includes uh, filling out an inspection form, taking pictures of uh, known contaminants, relaying that information back to the hauler that brought it to us, or if we're able to, the generator themselves. And ultimately, we uh, have the authority to reject incoming loads that are contaminated with large amounts of trash. So if that's the case, then the hauler would be responsible for the increased tipping fees, along with solid waste taxes, um, and county fees that are applied to solid waste that uh, recyclable and organic material is exempt from. So it's a huge incentive for the haulers and in their best interest to have the material cleaned up um, before it enters a processing facility. And obviously it's uh, beneficial for the composters themselves to be processing a clean uh, organic feedstock um, into a, a clean finished compost. Um, and I don't wanna dig too far in the weeds of uh, you know, the, what we're looking for uh, and, and how we build our piles. That's really, you know, if you sign up for a tour, I'd be happy to uh, go much more detail into this. But just to give you an idea of what we're aiming for is um, we want to have an ideal moisture content, an ideal oxygen levels, and an ideal uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And I really just included this slide because I wanted to give you a visual of kind of like a cross section of one of our piles of, of organic materials as it goes through the active composting stage. And if you can imagine what like a, a garbage bag or a large sheet of plastic film would be doing inside of that pile, um, you could see there's we have air being pumped into the piles to um, promote aerobic um, biodegradation. And if there's a big layer of plastic, it's going to block that air and kind of choke out certain areas of, uh, of the organic material. It'll also prevent um, proper drainage. So then you just have little areas of pooling water inside of those piles, causing uh, anaerobic conditions, which aside from creating some pretty nasty odors, is also a, a, a generates methane, uh, a known greenhouse gas, um, and slows down the composting process pretty quickly. Um, so once the material, if the contamination does actually enter our facility, we do have to manage it in some way. Uh, we typically use mechanical screeners to sort out contamination. Um, so once a load of organics is tipped at our facility, if it's accepted, if it's not rejected and sent to a landfill, if we accept it for processing, any of the residual contaminants that are uh, in that organic material uh, will go directly into the composting process. Um, so first we pile up that material into long, what we call windrows. Um, for about 45 days, we'll pump air into those piles, stimulate all that uh, biological activity, uh, allow the material to break down pretty rapidly. The heat will spike up in this early stage. Um, and then after about that 45 to 60 day mark, we will 
run that material into uh, a screener. So what we're using in this picture here is a trommel screen. Uh, so everything that is uh, two inches in diameter or greater will stay inside of that rotating drum. Um, and everything smaller than two inches will go into a different stream and into a conveyor system. But all that larger material will uh, go to a landfill. And the bulk of it is plasticky material that never was suited for composting in the first place. So um, that material needs to be managed um, you know, in some way. We need to get it out of the compost because it's not going to add any benefit to it. So removing it early on in the stage as early as possible um, is in our best interest. And we do get plenty of contaminants that we don't want to see. Um, I've included a few slides um, specifically from schools um, that, that participate in organics recycling. Uh, this picture here, you can see uh, plastic cutlery, plenty of milk cartons, um, small plastic uh, film products, so, I don't know if that's a chip bag or whatever it may be. But all of that material will enter the composting process assuming the load is accepted, um, in which case it's uh, either needs to be screened out or um, uh, worst case scenario is those products fragment and then enter the finished compost, lowering the value and marketability of that finished product. There's another picture, a uh, few known contaminants. Um, there are plenty of compostable alternatives to most products out there. Um, um, so plastic forks and spoons and knives, um, there's uh, dozens of compostable product manufacturers that offer alternatives um, that we encourage. Um, but once these plastic utensils, utensils actually do enter the composting process, best case scenario is we can screen them out. Uh, and then the worst case scenario is they fragment into small pieces, in which case it enters the finished compost um, and then lowers the value both aesthetically and you know potentially uh, harmful if it's something like a small piece of glass that shattered and goes in the composting process. You know, if you sell compost that looks like this to a customer, they probably won't be your customer for very, for very long uh, due to the low quality of material they'd be receiving. And that in on the right side of that picture is a little fruit sticker. And they, I believe, are the bane of my existence because they just will fall through every size screen we can uh, put in front of them and they at uh, grocery stores and and uh, the fruit and vegetable uh, growers feel the need to slap one of those stickers on every single banana on a bunch and I mean, I'm surprised they don't put them on every grape in a on a bunch too. We do receive a lot of produce and a lot have stickers on them that enter the composting process. Um, here are a few pictures of some reusable utensils. And if your school is investing in reusable um, uh, silverware and or trays, uh, it, it's a uh, you know, wasteful on multiple bases to uh, throw those away in the trash or the recycling or organics where it'll eventually end up in a landfill anyways. Um, and we have uh, magnets on some of our equipment. So that's why it kind of looks like it's consolidated in certain areas. Um, but it builds up and then we just receive, we just have a bunch of silverware laying around our site and we have to kind of go and clean up regularly to not make our site be an eyesore. And then milk cartons, probably one of the most frequent contaminants that we receive uh, from schools. Um, and we may have shot ourselves in the foot a little bit with uh, the milk carton issues because early on in our in the inception of uh, our company, we accepted milk cartons as an, an as a feedstock for composting, um, basing our acceptable material list off of some of the composters that had already established themselves out on the west coast and just adopting their policies. Um, but in this picture, I gave it just a full stream because clearly the school made a very concerted effort and did a fantastic job sorting all of the milk cartons. But once it goes to the organics uh, into the composting facilities, you know, it all gets pulled out. And uh, this, if they were in unbagged 
sent to a recycling facility. They could process and take out that paperboard and make it into uh, new products. But at a composting facility, it um, if it does actually enter the composting process, it causes headaches up and down the process. Um, if we can get it out early enough, then it just goes to the landfill and doesn't have any further use, unfortunately. Hey, Jake, when was that photo taken? Um, this was a while ago. Um, there's been an extensive education on getting the milk cartons out of the organic stream. This probably was 2018 or maybe 19. Okay, just wondering I, if this is recent or not, but good to yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, no, I've uh, seen a great improvement, not in not just in milk cartons, but in the quality of organics overall, um, just through frequent education, rejecting loads, making sure that the material uh, is suitable for composting has been one of my main jobs with the with the company um, and what I was initially hired to do was quality control. So um, relaying information as we receive it to haulers and and um, making sure that they're sending us clean material is mutually beneficial. Um, but when a milk carton goes through the composting process, the paperboard inside of those layers of plastic gets eaten away. And then you're left with this, like almost like a snake skin type shedding of material um, that will remain in the compost. Um, and if we're lucky, lucky, it'll remain intact like these few pictures. Um, but most likely the physical agitation of those screeners as the material gets flipped around in them, it's just going to fragment into uh, tiny pieces and uh, contaminate our finished compost. And once those um, tiny plastic particles enter the compost, the finished compost, it'll then get applied to your soil environment to you know, promote you know, you know, the many uses of compost. Um, and if it contains a bunch of little plastic fragments, then you're contaminating both the soil and ultimately the marine environment where everything ends up anyways uh, with these microplastics. Um, so, um, I included this slide, the, um, I cannot remember, I think the green cycle or eco cycle along with uh, uh, Green Mountain, I think maybe. Anyways, they put out this white paper uh, report about the hazards of composting plastic coated paper. And this slide really kind of jumped out at me because you know, to the naked eye, none of these things would really um, show up. Uh, but when you put them under a microscope, you can see the every one of the products that enters the food, uh, food waste, organics processing um, will leave residual microplastics along with it. So, you know, and it, it doesn't really even throw up any red flags on our end from the um, finished compost testing program that we run. Everything passes and it's you know, marketable and usable. But knowing that microplastics are contaminating finished compost, you know, it's a, a black eye on both the industry, uh, our company, and the, um, you know, the compost itself. So we make a strong effort to remove plastic coated paper products from our acceptable material list and really crack down on, uh, on the contamination as it enters our facility. And then, so this is kind of a, you know, uh, paper trays are an acceptable feedstock for composting. We willingly accept them. Um, but when they come to us stacked together like this, they almost like cement themselves together. And as soon as they get wet with either food waste or, you know, uh, just precipitation, they get really, really hard and kind of firm and cement themselves together. And the processing method that we use doesn't do enough to break it apart. So then we end up with just these blocks of um, paper trays that are nearly impossible to compost. I mean, if you imagine what a tiny bacteria and microorganisms are doing, they're just adhering to the surfaces of that compostable material and breaking it down. But if it's just a dense block, there's no way they can uh, penetrate all the way through it in the amount of time we need it to. Um, so we encourage schools to put paper trays in loosely 
Um, I know that goes against and it's kind of counterintuitive of saving space, uh, both in the dumpster and the bags themselves. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's unfortunate, <laughs> but just uh, keep in mind that if the trays are stacked, this is what's going to happen and they're not going to be processed. In a perfect world, we'd be able to grind up this material, um, but we can't grind up all of our organic, um, all the organic waste that we receive because then we'd be running the risk of grinding up um, contaminants that are frequently entering our compost facility. And if you grind up that stuff, then it's nearly impossible to uh, screen it out and have a, a clean finished product. So um, we'd encourage using reuse, reusable trays um, along with reusable silverware if your school is willing to invest in that initial overhead cost of uh, putting that product in place. Um, if not, you know, keep them loose. And if not that, that, then just, you know, know that it's probably going to go to a landfill and it's, you know, you could, <laughs> it would serve, it, it would help us if you just threw it in the trash if they're stacked together because this is what we end up with. Um, but we do also receive clean organics and, you know, I highlight the negative ones to get a message across, but, you know, the majority of the organics that we receive um, are clean and and um, an ideal feedstock for processing and turning into finished compost. Uh, this particular picture, both of these pictures, probably would have a better use higher up on the um, organic waste management hierarchy. Um, there's probably plenty of usable food that can go to human consumption. If not that, then a food to livestock program. Um, but grocery stores, unfortunately, they just, you know, have shelves that need to be frequently stocked and they need to pull off anything. And even if it's perfectly good and unspoiled, it uh, comes to a facility where at least it's not going to a landfill, uh, getting and it's getting processed into finished compost. But obviously, this could have a more beneficial use. Um, schools, I'm sure, have um, plenty of back of house food that um, can go to um, food shelves. Um, but, you know, just trying to keep in mind, um, you know, getting the best use out of the food and uh, not wasting it. And even, you know, increasing the, the uh, value of it throughout the, the process. But yeah, that finished compost or fin uh, clean food waste creates clean compost, which is what we're after. And once we have a clean finished compost, it has tremendous value, both environmentally and to as a, as a marketable commodity. Um, so we sell finished compost throughout the community and the actual environmental benefits um, of that compost, both um, on the front end from waste prevention to the back end of compost use are tremendous. Um, on the front end, you're saving landfill space. Obviously not putting that material into a landfill is beneficial. Uh, or in the case of some of the more, you know, like Minneapolis or um, St. Paul, where all that, a lot of that material goes to incineration. Uh, if you imagine burning a watermelon, it's not going to get you a great heat value, and you're probably going to have a negative BTU rate for uh, incinerating that and turning into electricity. Um, in a landfill, of course, it's creating greenhouse gas emissions um, and ultimately creating a marketable commodity out of a waste product, which is what we're after. Uh, and that product itself uh, has just uh, great value in its own. Um, it uh, increases the filtration rate in compacted soils, in, improves water hold, holding capacity, so you don't need to irrigate your uh, gardens or lawns or fields nearly as much. Um, using it in like a rain garden application, you can increase the filtration rate of the soil, but then also compost itself has a unique ability to bind and degrade pollutants over time. So you're cleaning up and filtering out that uh, contaminated uh, surface water as it runs off of an impervious surface. And then of course, uh, you're adding um, a lot of nutrients and uh, an organic matter back into the soil, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, and then just here are some of the uh, many uses that finished compost has. I mentioned the rain garden uh, media, uh, mixing compost with sand is an ideal rain garden media that you can apply to any um, any spot that you want a rain garden or you want to have a, a 
pre-treatment option for your surface waters. Also adding finished compost to a steep bluff um, helps minimize erosion as well as establishes plant life will, that will then um, prevent erosion themselves. Gardening and landscaping are kind of the you know, more obvious and well-known uses of compost. Uh, top dressing lawns is another um, interesting um, use of it. You can add just like a quarter inch or half inch layer of compost on your lawn and that'll help uh, retain moisture, especially in these droughty years we've been having uh, and add nutrients and organic matter to your lawns. And then the, that bottom middle slide, uh, the DOT recommends using compost anytime a roadside construction or a, a new development goes in. Um, because driving around that heavy equipment on the compacted so on, on soils will compact it and dry it out and depleted nutrients, especially if they're scraping off the top layer to get down to a base to build onto. So adding compost to um, that um, damaged soil is a great way to um, improve the soil quality, which will then improve the likelihood of plants and trees surviving in that soil and, and contributing to a healthy environment. Um, so yeah, I see like a dozen or so red little chat block, um, chat circles. So <laughs> I can field some of those now if, uh, if time allows. Thank you, Jake. Very interesting. And it's so helpful to see like, this is where our organics actually goes. Like it doesn't just go in the bags off to Neverland. Like this is where it goes. So it's just helpful to see from and hear from you on the ground, like what what are the banes of your existence and how can we help make it more of a clean material for you to make it actually usable? And that's something I actually learned when Jake um, sent me over the presentation. Initially, I'm like, you know, I've heard a little bit about the stack trays, but that has an, in the past been a best practice from Dakota County. So, you know, we are learning as well. Like actually when we stack a ton of paper trays together, they become a cement block and are not, useful for composting. So yes, it is convenient to stack and then put all in one container at a time because then you can save on bags and resources and time, but we will need to think through new best practices to assist with that. And maybe it's putting them in loosely in the dumpster at the end of lunch um, and still stacking them, but then throwing them loosely. I'm not sure. Obviously the overall goal would be we wouldn't have to deal with paper trays ever if we all get to reusables in the future. So I think it's just really great to continue the learning um, on all of our ends from where we're at. So thanks, Jake. I know a lot of the questions in here, um, some of them are related to your presentation. I think some of them are just overall questions. So I can field a few of them. Um, Melinda, you had asked, are we allowed to send unused foods to the food shelf? I did just put a link in here um, that's to our organics and food waste in school webpage. And I'll be um, mentioning in the, our next presentation, we'll have links to that webpage in it as well. But it does mention in here like food to people organizations, food donation organizations um, are listed that you can reach out to. Um, very much so, yes. <laughs> um, we would love for you to donate food, um, then food to animals if possible or available to you then composting for all the food scraps that aren't edible anymore. So um, there should be more information for you there and food donors are protected um, by the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Act. So yes, please uh, let me know if you have more questions after the workshop about that. Um, Alicia said, when you send compostables to the landfill, do they still compost there? And is that still better than using non-compostable single use things or do they present problems at the landfill. And I see Peter's still on. Um, this is a question <laughs> that I've talked with um, with my team um, because on in our perspective, it's, you know, we are focused on waste, getting things out of the waste container um, and either getting them to recycling or organics. When it gets to the landfill, it's basically what I've heard, but Peter, maybe you have more information to share. It's, it's basically a tomb it's not exposed to oxygen, things aren't breaking down there. Um, but if you're doing styrofoam versus paperboard and they're both going to a landfill because you don't have a composting program at all, then that's another question. 
purchasing compostable products without a composting program might not make as much sense from a waste perspective, but there are other perspectives to consider with toxicity and overall aesthetics and student input. So that is a really tough question to answer. And it totally is dependent on your community and kind of what waste streams or hauling you have available to you as well. So Peter, do you have anything to add at that? I mean, you covered it really well, Allie. I just think it's really complicated. So the paper product may actually have more inputs to be manufactured than a styrofoam tray. Um, if they both end up in the landfill, it may be worse. So that greenhouse, from a greenhouse gas perspective, um, the styrofoam tray isn't going to decompose um, in the landfill and you're actually sequestering a little bit of carbon that way, um, which seems counterintuitive, right? So it's messy. Um, certainly, if you have a compostable product, we want to see it composted is the bottom line. Um, but like Ali said, the landfills get compacted so tightly that when you pull apart an old landfill, you can find a newspaper from the 1950s and still read it. And that newspaper is perfectly biodegradable, but it doesn't degrade in the landfill because there's no air that allows it to decompose. So it just sits there and it's almost like a time capsule. Right. Thanks, Peter. Yep. Yeah, it's a it's a tough question. And I mean, the answer for everything, if possible, is reusables. And that's why that's the direction we're hoping to move. So we don't have to wonder where things need to be sorted and um, yeah, their highest and best use. So that's a great question. Uh, and we had another question about the recycling of paper trays. I see John, thanks for jumping in there. Um, so yes, if it's BPI certified, it can go to the organics facility. Um, so Jake's facility here. Um, if it's not BPI certified, um, it should be going in the trash. And I'll talk more about that in a second, because now if it's not BPI certified, it might be lined with plastic. And we don't want to be sending microplastics to the finished compost, as we learned. So um, the recyclability of them, they're kind of made up like the consistency of an egg carton material. So it's once it's food soiled, it's not recyclable. We don't want to be putting that in the recycling. But um, we also overall, it's just not a high value recyclable. So they are not recyclable um, in our system from what we've heard from our recycling facilities. We will have a recycling facility speaking um, in a half hour or so. So you can feel free to ask her if she has another take on that. It's not a huge contaminant, but why put something in the recycling bin? to travel all the way to the recycling facility. And then the paper manufacturer, when they put it in the vat of water, it just falls apart because the strands are too short at that point. It's basically like a napkin material. So it might be a longer answer than you're looking for. It's just not a very valuable recyclable and most likely it's food soiled, which makes it trash. So <laughs> hopefully I'm not losing anyone. These are great questions. Oh my gosh. Peter has his hand up. That might be a high five. No, nope, it was my hand up. <laughs> oh, it was, okay. Yeah, um, there's a question about anaerobic composting that I thought I should address is that um, in an anaerobic digester, it's a closed system. So it's encapsulated in a, in a large vat and all of the gas that's generated in that anaerobic condition um, is methane, but it's captured and then sold to be used as natural gas. Um, so it doesn't have the same impacts as methane generated in a landfill that often escapes off the working face. Um, so it, it utilizes that biogenic gas for um, any type of fuel, whether it's a compressed natural gas truck or any other natural gas option. Um, so it's a really good use for that waste. And then afterward, the digestate would still exist and you would aerobically compost that digestate in aerobic conditions at a facility like Jake's at SET there. So hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. And thank you, Jake. I mean, you're generating a lot of questions here. So 
Uh, anything you. else quick before we move on? What was that? I was just thanking you. Awesome. Okay. Well, Jake's contact is also available if you have further follow-up questions and uh, he might be hanging out here for a little bit longer too. Uh, but I'm gonna share my screen and jump into the next section on successful food scraps collection after we heard from Jake here. So give I'm gonna drop second. off Allie. Okay, um, thanks. Peter. But if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to me. It's been a pleasure seeing you all today. Thank you. All right. So I'm looking forward to sharing my knowledge related to successful food scraps collection because now we see from Jake where our organics is going. Uh, we want to be able to make, have it be made, our food scraps into clean compost without the contamination. So our Dakota County ordinance um, has recycling requirements such as pairing all trash with recycling containers, labeling all, all containers, and that's for all schools. Um, most schools are also required to collect organics and it applies if a school meets these criteria, all of these criteria. So if you generate at least eight cubic yards of trash per week, have on-site dining and generate food scraps in back of house areas. Um, so for example, if you had a four cubic yard dumpster empty twice a week and food scraps from kitchen meal prep, you would be required to collect food scraps. So this is going to apply to most schools. Uh, there are currently two ways food scraps are collected in Dakota County schools a food to animals program. So that's only food, no napkins or products because it's being brought to feed pigs. That doesn't require the use of compostable bags as the food is put directly into provided barrels or um, brought to a commercial compost facility like SET to be made into compost. And that's usually bagged in the compostable bags collected in the Carter dumpster as shown on this slide. So that's the option most of Dakota County schools are using. And that's mostly just due to current services offered in our area. So in an organics composting program, all types of food scraps and BPI certified products can be collected. The hauler is going to pick up your organics and deliver it to a commercial composting facility like SET where it's turned into that compost a nutrient rich soil amendment. And it's used to improve soil and prevent soil erosion and runoff. Um, the food to animals program, the food only is collected. Uh, farms are providing lined plastic carts on wheels that are cleaned each time they're collected and it's sent to farms and cooked uh, to eliminate that harmful bacteria. So both of these avoid the food from ever going to the landfill where we just talked about it's buried and not exposed to oxygen. So it's really not ever able to break down and it generates that methane gas. So we're gonna have a quick poll um, and Kirsten's going to pull that up for us. Yeah. Uh, Natalie, but, while I pull yeah, up the ahead. poll, do you um, want to answer the question from Kim? She is asking about the requirements and if it includes private schools. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. It includes all public and non-public schools. Okay. Thank yep. you. Good question. All right. Do you want to explain the poll and then I'll launch it? Yeah. It's basically just where I'm, I'm curious to know it's actually a there is a right answer <laughs> um where is food scraps collection required in most schools and i just want to see what your thoughts are all right i feel like we need music do, do, i know do 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 <laughs> we got about yeah 60 some percent we'll give it about 10 more seconds thanks for participating all right i think we should be good we got 81 percent. awesome all right and here we so go let's let's see what do the people say okay so it looks like um, in our minds, where food scraps recycling or food scraps, I hate that term. I don't know why that just came out of my mouth. Food scraps or organics collection, it is not recycling, um, is required in Dakota County schools. We think it might be all areas where food scraps are generated. So the cafeteria, kitchen, and staff lounge. Um, actually, we're going to go to this next slide. 
it's only required in back of house non-public areas. So areas behind the scenes, not food that's been served to the students or the public, anywhere that is generating food scraps from food prep is where we want to be collecting organics. The most common space that's like this in a school is the kitchen. The kitchen spaces have the ability to train limited number of employees to ensure only food scraps are being collected and contamination is kept out. So to do that, besides contracting with a waste hauler or permitted animal, you know, livestock manufacturer for service, what else is needed to implement a food scraps collection program? Uh, we know recycling and organics hauling is exempt from the 17% state tax. Uh, you'll want to order enough containers to place next to trash containers. These on this slide are our most common containers we purchase in our grant program for kitchen spaces with or without dollies based on your preference. Um, cover up any recycling symbols that may be printed on these containers. And if possible, we're choosing green containers. Um, it's not a requirement for it to be green, um, but our label is required and our labels are color coded. We have free labels to make that easy. So collecting organics for composting in bags that are certified by the Biodegradable Products Institute, BPI, um, and have that logo on the product or packaging is important. We actually have in our state of Minnesota, a state contract for compostable bags and products. I've linked all of that information here. Um, there's outlets for schools on our website to purchase bags. They aren't going through the state contract as a public school, or you can just check out the state contract and get your own pricing. Um, we also wanna make sure we're educating employees, including teachers, food service, housekeeping staff, and students if they're going to be sorting about organics collection. Um, and how to set up a successful program. So we're gonna be talking a little bit more about that later on. But what about the cafeteria? I could just feel it. Uh, since 2013, our school program has been providing funding for organics programs, developing collection best practices. Even before that, we were piloting with school districts doing indoor composting, which started in the early 2000s. So when composting programs first began, we collected milk cartons as organics. And as we know now from Jake, as a reminder, we can no longer do this because milk cartons are lined with plastic, which results in microplastics in our finished compost. But thankfully they're now recyclable. Um, but for the last decade, when we've been starting our organics programs, we've started with the cafeteria and kitchen, maybe adding on the staff lounge and bathrooms with classrooms only for advanced schools. And as organics programs have grown, and compost facilities have made and sold more finished compost, we've continued learning more. So our approach with organics is different than it was even just a few years ago. Uh, we're now starting with kitchens and back of house spaces first. That's what's required in our ordinance. Um, collecting food outside of that area, um, outside of the behind the scenes area is optional. So it must be determined in your own school that organics can be collected successfully with limited contamination outside of that back of house space, um, because we want to have clean compost for the compost facilities to have a good quality product. And we don't wanna be getting rejections from our haulers and have to pay those fees. So here you can see four examples of cafeteria sorting stations, half with organics collection, half without. So how do you decide what's best for your school? These are the keys to success, I think, for any organics collection outside of the back of house kitchen spaces. So I'm going to highlight each of them in more depth uh, briefly. You can see in the school photos here that contaminated organics with chip bags and plastic leads to contaminated organics at the composting facility. So what does the organics collected at your school look like? If it looks like the top photo in the kitchen space, it's clear we need staff education training as that space, it's not optional. But if it looks like that in the cafeteria, the program's going to need major adjustments in order for us to have it continue. And over the last decade, as we've learned more and technology has changed, there's been updates to acceptable materials, both with recycling and organics. Um, the Biodegradable Products Institute, BPI, certifies food serviceware products as compostable. So anything going into the organics container other than food needs to be BPI certified with that logo on the product or the product box. Terms like biodegradable, green, made from corn, compostable without the certification from BPI, are likely all gimmick products. Uh, you can see in the photos on the far right here how confusing these terms can be. 
earth-friendly cutlery made from corn. And on the other side of the box, which you can't see, it actually says 70% less plastic. Um, so this, these were utensils that a school was composting because they were under the impression these were compostable. Um, we used to say the tear test or other ways we used in the past to determine if something was plastic lined. That's no longer accurate. It has to be BPI certified to make sure it's not lined with that plastic because we know plastic coated paper products will cause microplastics in the finished compo compost. And that has unknown consequences on our land and water. So when in doubt, keep it out. Focus on our food only if you aren't sure or can't get confirmation on a product. And though it might feel better in the moment to wish cycle and hope something's compostable, just think of Jake's picture of that microplastic lining in the finished compost and imagine that coming off all of your BPI or non-BPI certified paper products. Um, in Dakota County, our designated list of organics um, used for our ordinance requirement focuses on food scraps only. That is intentional. We ideally in a food service program in the future, students would only have food on their tray to worry about. Um, the changes that are to come in the future only impact schools using disposable products. So trying to consider at your school, are all of the products you're using really needed? Or is there another way that you can serve the food? Hey, Allie, there is a question on the last slide. Yeah. Um, are the red white boats compostable? Yeah, good question. I would love to know the answer to that question. It sure. depends. Uh, I've heard from some schools they've been able to follow the trail long enough to find out that they are BPI certified, um, but that was several years ago and prod as products change, you really have to talk to you where you're getting your products, your, your vendors, and they need to follow the chain up to the manufacturers. And if they're not able to provide that BPI certification, it's really a question mark, so leave it out. Mm -hmm. And that that feels icky to say because we want to compost it all, um, but we we can't be because we really want to make sure we're we're having that clean compost. And so maybe there's a way, like I'm talking about on this slide, serving directly on the tray. Can we eliminate the boat completely in the future? Um, that's something you'll have to determine at your school. Or is there a truly a BPI certified boat we can use? So no, great question. So as it, at your school, is it possible to empower students to put items directly on your tray or serve them in bulk? Because serving in bulk with offer versus serve can also help you decrease waste and prevent food spoilage with students just eating what they plan, taking what they plan to eat while still meeting meal requirements. Another example is implementing condiment dispensers to replace condiment packets or pre-portioned individual cups. That eliminates the need to throw away extra pre-portioned cups that weren't taken from the table. Um, but serving in bulk, bulk helps decrease the time spent purchasing, storing, preparing, um, packaging that's used once and thrown away, as well as the cost to purchase and haul away that material. Um, so you're paying for it every step of the way. Um, it also eliminates that waste and simplifies the sorting process for students. So consider how many sorting decisions we're asking students to make um, with ever-changing products depending on the day and the menu. Um, how can we help in that area make sorting more successful? Um, so the answer is serving less products. <laughs> uh, even simple changes like a bulk napkin dispenser have reduced the number of napkins used to prevent from taking multiple at a time. Um, and that first school recently was provided at their napkin vendor at no cost. So several schools in Dakota County have also began using bulk milk dispensers, which is eliminating that milk carton completely, which is exciting. Reusable products also help support the transition away from single use alternatives, such as disposable utensils, trays, bowls, with cost savings and waste reduction benefits. So we currently provide funding for these items through our school waste prevention recycling grant. Uh, two Minnetonka middle schools were highlighted in a state case study recently and were able to have an estimated savings $23,000 over three years and reduce greenhouse gases by 77% as well as water consumption by tens of thousands of gallons by switching to reusable utensils and bowls. Um, so reusable items just eliminate that need for resources and materials to be produced, transported, and then for us to dispose of them. And like Peter said, recycling is important, but waste reduction and reuse is best and better than recycling. So we really want to eliminate products and avoid that individual disposable packaging wherever possible to save money on hauling, 
packaging waste and reduce that contamination and confusion for the students. So less to sort, less items to potentially contaminate the organics container. So this student in this photo is uh, approaching the sorting station, uh, ready to get back to class. The sandwich and milk carton are unopened, as we can see. So putting those on the food share table first would be ideal if that existed, but the school did not have that yet. So when students come up to the sorting station, always should be pre-sorted on their tray into categories first and grouped together. So all packaging emptied out. That is um, something we're working on developing as a best practice, sorting at our table first. So having items left inside the packaging when we get up to the station makes sorting really challenging. If I have a sandwich or carrots in a plastic bag half eaten, or maybe I had fruit left in that plastic portion cup on his tray, and now I wanna put my food in the organics, but that's gonna require me to either have a third hand to unwrap it and cause a time delay for the students standing behind me, or I might forget my food's wrapped in plastic because I just wanna compost. And now I'm contaminating the organics and I'm wish likely. So several schools have begun educating students about sorting first at the table into categories before coming up to the sorting station with huge success. And um, schools also have staff dismiss tables for sorting to avoid the mad rush at the end of lunch. So they're sorting it into those categories of recycling here, all my wrappers in the middle for trash, and then my food last. Staff and student support's imperative to a successful organics collection program, no matter where the collection is taking place. So from organics in the cafeteria, we know the most successful programs have an adult staff sorting monitor. For whatever reason in human psychology, we sort better when someone's watching us. Um, it's also necessary to have green team buy-in support. So there are schools that have a rotating calendar of students to be waste watchers that week, providing education at the sorting station, or focusing on ways to incorporate it into the school culture by sharing common questions during school announcements and assemblies. Some schools have also incorporated organics decontamination into a student job, just like wiping down tables. So that waste grabber that you see on the upper right photo, it's like a robot arm to students and it's fun to use. So students can use the robot arm after the lunch period ends. We've heard from some schools it doesn't work well while the sorting is taking place because it slows that process down. Um, and they can focus on that organics container and ensure the recycling and organics are clean, pulling out those contaminants. And then if there's time, they can look in the trash. But um, we really want to focus our energy on making sure our organics and recycling is clean. So what does your sorting station look like? That, that order of containers is really important. Our best practice is liquids first to dump the milk cartons, then recycle because we have our milk carton in our hand already. Uh, trash for wrappers and plastic packaging, and then organics and food scraps last so students can dump their remaining tray contents or put their tray in the organics if it's BPI certified um, as well. So two school districts in our county actually have stainless steel sorting tables in every elementary school district wide. So if organics is being collected, it can be difficult for students to sort while balancing that tray and that sorting table helps provide them a place to set it down and sort properly. And you can see it also allowed them to hang real examples above each container, because for whatever reason, our brains tend to do better with actual 3D examples. Um, images on that label are helpful, but those work best. So uh, I think in your school, when, you, when you're going back there, or you're thinking about last the end of last school year, looking in that cafeteria recycling container, how is it going? If it's contaminated in the recycling, organics most likely isn't doing much better. Uh, a lid with a hole can be added to the recycling container to prevent students from dumping that entire tray. And we're required to have recycling containers paired next to every trash container, but we're not required to have organics in the cafeteria. So if it's not going well, uh, my recommendation would be to focus that student energy back on recycling right. And then if and when changes are made to ensure sorting will go successfully, like bulk service, reusables, we can always add back organics collection in the cafeteria when we're ready. So I wanted to highlight St. Thomas Academy in Mendota Heights. They serve students in grades six through 12. They're successfully collecting organics in the kitchen and cafeteria areas. What makes them successful? So the only disposable products St. Thomas Academy is currently using are the paper boats on Nacho Day. Other than that, it's just the napkins and the organics 
and the milk cartons and the recycling. Uh, reusable plates, bowls, utensils, they're used with the bulk service. Um, they're hoping to look into bulk milk dispensers in the near future to eliminate those cartons as well. So as you can see in these photos, the organics is very clean. It's made up of food scraps and napkins, and that's due to the systems they have in place. They also eat their breakfast in the cafeteria. Um, and that investment in bulk service and reusables ensures the organics collection has little contamination. And they actually are unique in the fact, fact that they have food to animals and compost, uh, organics for composting pickups. They have both services going on at their school. Um, the organics from the cafeteria includes napkins and the food. So they use the organics hauling to a compost facility for that material. And then for the kitchen, they use a food to animals program where they're provided the lined root containers on wheels for food only. And then they're brought for animal feed. So focus on wasted food prevention is important. We'd recommend ideally even before implementing an organics collection program in the cafeteria or for the majority of schools that already have an organics collection program in the cafeteria, do this now because we develop these wasted food prevention best practices later. 40% um, of all food is wasted in our country. Um, that's an average of 400 pounds of food per person and 63 million tons of food uh, along with that, the resources uh, that went into producing and transporting food that isn't eaten. So even if we compost that food, which is better than it going to a landfill, all the resources used to produce it are still wasted. So how can we, how can we make a difference on that? Um, school cafeterias offer that opportunity to reduce wasted food and educate students. Dakota County has developed those wasted food prevention best practices, implemented ideas in schools, including student tray audits, food share tables, flavor stations, water access, and educating students on the meal requirements and time to eat reminders. So you can see in the food recovery hierarchy how, we, how our actions are prioritized. So the top two levels are prevention and diverting wasted food to people. Composting is great, but it's not until the fifth tier. So even though it has those benefits to improve soils and water quality and we're always gonna have inedible parts of food. Um, there's other tiers higher up in that hierarchy um, that are better, a better outlet for our edible food and the food to animal programs are higher on the list than composting if it's available to you. So like I mentioned, food rescue organizations want your unwanted edible food and schools are protected by the Bill Emerson Samaritan Food Act. So you can check out our wasted food prevention webpage to get started. We also provide resources to do this in our grant program. So more resources are linked here. Uh, we have mini grants as well that are offered year round. If you just need assistance on getting started with your back of house organics in the kitchen, we just need a few containers and we need a six month free supply of compostable bags to get started, we provide that. Um, so just let us know how we can help support you. Um, or with reusables, maybe we, we want to apply for a large project grant because we really want to make that investment in bulk service and reusables so our organics is successful. So um, that's all I have here. And I want to switch gears to discuss organics education briefly, uh, both required and a brainstorm for any other ideas you have. So I wanted to start with required organics education. So in, Daco in Dakota County, public and private schools are required to provide standardized recycling and organics education to reduce confusion about what can and cannot be recycled and commercially composted or fed to animals. So specifically, these are our education requirements, um, providing the standardized messaging to all employees, food service staff, custodial housekeeping staff, and students if there's organics in the cafeteria. Um, or anyone else responsible for sorting, collecting, or managing organics. And that must include that that must happen and occur at least in those time frames that you see. So annually, within 30 days of a new hire of a new student or a new staff, um, and then 30 days of a substantial change to your program for recycling or organics. And our education that's required must cover what to collect and what can and cannot be placed into organics containers using the standardized language that's provided by us as the county. And all of these same requirements apply to recycling. The recycling requirements apply to everyone, no matter who you are in the school. Organics, we know it's just if you're, you know, sorting, managing, or collecting that, that waste. So 
be based on where it is in your school, at least back of house, if you fall under those requirements. We have free materials to help meet your educational requirements. Uh, this folder linked here, so you'll see all these slides on our webpage later. You can click on this. Um, this folder has resources such as articles for sharing, PowerPoint presentations with talking points, images and icons, and then we also have recycling guides to help train on what can and cannot be composted, as well as similar resources for recycling. Um, and we're working to develop more educational resources in the future. Um, we've heard ideas for social media posters, uh, articles, other ideas um, that you might have. So we realize our resources right now are a little dry and we would love to know uh, what other resources you're implementing or what you would like to see. So I have a quick poll, um, if you're willing to pull that up for me, Kirsten. And I'm curious if anyone has used our county provided school training resources for recycling or education yet, or even maybe you didn't know these existed. And I'm checking out the chat while you're taking the survey too. Some good discussion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks Jake for the clarification on the boats. Give you about five more seconds for this survey. Mm -hmm. Great to know, Kim, the stainless steel table is working well. And they can make adjustments on the height. So if you're having issues with that, Melissa, maybe we'll talk offline. So I think we got most respondents. All right. So it's about majority here that didn't know these resources existed or weren't sure. Do you want so, me to hear the results, Allie? Yeah, that'd be great. So I'm glad we're talking about this. Now you, now you have something to look for in a month um, for what maybe we can use for organics education for our staff and students if applicable. So really quickly, here are a few um, above and beyond ideas I've seen recently at schools to enhance the required organics education, fully close that loop of understanding around composting. Outdoor compost bins, these can be implemented with or without organics collection anytime to enhance the education, oftentimes paired with a school garden. So food might not be involved in the composting process at all. Some schools just compost leaves and garden waste. Other schools have started a fruit and vegetable container um, for small food scraps in the staff lounge refrigerator for staff to contribute and provide to students to use when learning about composting with the outdoor bin. Um, compost created can be used as a part of the school garden or on school projects. Uh, or just kept in the bin as worms and microorganisms will take care of it. I'm a lazy composter, so I don't do anything with my compost. It just sits and goes into the soil and somehow there's still room in the bin the next day. Worm composting, vermicomposting is what that's known as, allows students to touch and feel some of the critters that go into work on their food waste. And it's another way to get hands-on. It's done indoors in a small bin, doesn't require any outdoor space. And then other ideas. So that includes showing an existing video on organics. We talked about that a little bit. Having students create their own. Um, that's what this screenshot is of School of Environmental Studies in Apple Valley. They created a, a sorting video. Um, Plate to Garden is an organization that allows schools to raise money while educating about the benefits of composting and using finished compost. So they deliver compost and provide bags and equipment. And then you sell the bags and have volunteers to um, kind of raise awareness for your parents and school community while making money. Um, some schools have used composting books. We have recommendations for those if needed and have incentives for students to pick a book from the library or older students reading to younger students. And then in the upper right corner, you can see one school created display. Um, this could also be done with Ziploc baggies quite easily with a recyclable item, a compostable item, and a trash item to watch the decomposition process. So we have a, a composting education kit that you can reserve that's similar to this, that you can see um, what the composting process is and then create that on your own um, for students to get some understanding of how do products break down. Uh, we also provide free busing for field trips to visit recycling facilities, landfills and compost sites, which I'll provide more information later on. So thank you.
Um, we had great ideas shared and um, I think we have a few questions that we answered in the chat. So we're gonna jump into our next topic on bagless recycling. So when I say re recycling must be bagless, I'm referring to the outdoor dumpster or the outdoor cart. Schools are able to do anything with, well, anything that they would like with the indoor recycling collection containers. So we're going to do a quick poll um, on bagless recycling while I introduce Katie. And Katie's gonna be sharing her screen next. Uh, so to start us off on this topic, we're going to have Katie Drews, but first we're going to have a poll. Um, I want to know what people are most concerned with, because that would help us talk about things that are relevant to you. So take 20 seconds and answer this poll if you can. And if you're not sure because you don't deal with outdoor recycling, um, you can uh, pick one that you think would be um, a bane of a custodian's existence in your school, if you've heard anything from them. Otherwise, you can opt out too. All right, thanks for answering. Got almost 70% participating. We'll give it five more seconds. All right. I think we're good if you're willing to share, Kirsten. So it looks like items blowing out of the dumpsters are number one concern, but also cleanliness of our dumpster and increased staff time. So that's helpful to know. Um, and we will talk about some of those things or all of these things um, in this next presentation. So uh, we have Katie Drews first to talk from a recycling facility perspective. Katie serves as the Senior Vice President at Eureka Recycling in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's been with the nonprofit Zero Waste Social Enterprise since 2021 and provides executive leadership for organizational strategy, communications, customer service, client con contracts, and community engagement and education. Katie also sits on the Recycling Education Steering Committee. Katie came to Eureka with experience in higher education, corporate, and nonprofit organizations with much of her professional background in marketing and business strategy. She holds both a BBA and an MBA from Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. So welcome, Katie. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so she can share hers. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. I'm going to uh, give this a try here and share my screen. Give me one second. Thanks, Katie. All right. Does that all look right to y'all? Can you see everything there? Yes. Perfect. Looks great. All right. Give me one second here. Get all of my screens right here. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks for the introduction, Ali. Uh, my name's Katie Drews. Like she said, I've been here with Eureka for a few years, for a couple of years now. Um, and I thought I'd start by giving you a little bit of background about uh, Eureka Recycling. And some of you, if you live in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, White Bear, Shoreview, Roseville, Lauderdale, um, or some other surrounding communities, your recycling might come to our facility, or your, if you live in those communities, your recycling definitely comes to our facility. Um, we also process and haul for uh, St. Paul and some other communities communities as well. Um, so that means we go out there, we pick up the recycling, we bring it back here. So we are a um, 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we started just over 20 years ago, and uh, we kind of came out of um, a, a grassroots kind of community effort who really wanted recycling in their communities. So our mission is to demonstrate that waste is preventable. We operate as a zero waste lab, meaning we learn from all the operations and all the things that we do so that we can, and we call kind of, we kind of jokingly call that our view from the pile. Um, and we use that to help educate, um, create policy that helps us move the needle forward on reducing waste and changing the systems. Um, and in our advocacy work and um, doing things like this as well. Um, we really wanna make it easier for uh, our community to recycle more 
waste less. Um, and so, like I said, we hold the two largest contracts right now for recycling. Um, and so we are doing this at a very large scale. So while we often talk about the fact that we're a nonprofit, um, we are a full business with revenue um, running two very large uh, operations. So we're going out there collecting in our trucks and then we're bringing all that material back here and we're processing it every day. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how recycling is done here in the Twin Cities. And um, we do that at a facility called a MRF, and that's a material recovery facility. And this gives you a little bit of a view of, um, of our MRF not in action. Um, we do provide facility tours. So if anyone's really interested in coming and seeing how uh, the sausage is made, so to speak, um, uh, you can reach out and do a tour. Um, so really what we do is we use a variety of mechanical, technological, and manual processes um, to sort all the material that we, that we receive into about 12 to 15 different commodity categories. Um, and essentially we're creating, we're producing manufacturing feedstock every day. So all of those things that you're sending to us will definitely be turned into something new. Um, our first, our facility is really that first stop for materials in their recycling, um, in their recycling journey and their, in their next phase of life. Um, so what you'll see, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this and the point of showing you all of the processes is so that you understand why bagless recycling is so important. Um, and, and at the end of the day, all of this material does get sold. Uh, we sell them into what we call end markets where they are then further cleaned and processed uh, to turn into something um, new. Um, our facility is designed to sort paper, cardboard, bottles, and cans. Uh, so recycling is very regional. So this is how we do it here in the Twin Cities and how we do it is very similar to um, how some other MRFs, we are one of seven um, and we all have very similar um, operations. So even if you live in a community where your material might not come to us, uh, what you'll hear here today is, um, is the same for your community. Uh, and then you can think about that for your school uh, system as well. So the accepted materials that we receive, uh, take here, like I said, aluminum, steel, glass, cardboard, paper, um, and then three different kinds of plastic. You'll notice here there is no number four plastic, which is low density polyethylene, uh, which plastic bags are made out of. So we only accept the number one PET, which is your uh, single use plastic soda and water bottles. Uh, number two, high density polyethylene, um, which are your uh, milk jugs, your laundry detergent uh, bottles. They're a little um, thicker uh, and more durable than your number one PET. And then number five, polypropylene. Those tend to be your tubs and lids. Um, and for the most part, you can think of those as like the packaging that dairy foods come in, yogurt, cream cheese, cottage cheese, sour cream, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and then also milk cartons and juice boxes also can also come here. Uh, and then just so you all know for your residential recycling, um, you'll notice that all the lids are on uh, these bottles. Um, so when you're throwing something into your bin, make sure you keep that lid on. Uh, it is recyclable. It'll go through the system. Um, they are they are, um, we usually say if it's a mixed material, uh, it's not recyclable, but in this case, what happens um, at the next stage of the processing is that material gets shredded up and then it gets submerged and the plastic in the cap uh, will actually float and the plastic in the um, bottles will sink. Then they're able to separate it and both will continue on their recycling journey. That's a good little tidbit I like to add in for people as like a, a quick tip. So in our facility, our major concerns are lithium batteries. And so those are the, can be the bigger ones uh, that you see on a uh, like rechargeable um, hand tool um, or power tool. 
Um, and they can also be these little disc guys that are seemingly innocuous and um, you might find in a greeting card that lights up or sings you a song and you think, oh, this whole thing is, is paper fiber. I can throw that into my recycle bin. But what actually happens is those little disc uh, um, lithium batteries end up in our facility. And what happens on impact, um, those things can combust and create a fire. So you can imagine that once they are in our facility surrounded by so much paper, that can pose a really big uh, hazard to our teams and to our facility. The other things we don't wanna see are uh, what we call tanglers. These are your garden hoses, holiday lights, uh, electrical cords, those don't belong in your um, facility. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of why when we talk uh, a little bit more about plastic bags um and scrap metal these things don't don't flow through our facility properly and they can also cause uh, damage to our machinery and injury to our folks um if you look at some of these um scrap metal pieces they can they're big they're jagged they can roll off they can hit they can uh cut through our machinery and they could definitely injure uh, employees and then maybe most importantly for today plastic bags so let's dig into that a little bit. I'm going to tell you why, and then I'll show you um, how it flows to our facility so you get an understanding of why. Uh, so in our facility um, and others around the nation, um, bagless uh, recycling is really important because um, they pose really significant challenges to the way our facilities operate, um, and they make it less effective for us to collect clean sorted material. Um, so we often, um, I'll, I'll show you this in the next couple of slides here, but our, the malfunctions in the processing are probably one of the bigger issues. Um, the lightweight and flexible nature of the material ends up wrapping around our machinery. And what we really need are gaps in our machinery so that things can fall through. So in our facility, we're separating by size, weight, and shape. And we start by separating out all of those flat products. So that's your big cardboard, your pieces of paper, and those things are meant to flow up and over our machines. Um, when the plastic bags wrap around the equipment, they um, make it so that things can't flow through the equipment. So things like bottles, cans, smaller pieces of paper and plastic, they won't be able to fall because that, that plastic has wrapped around it. Um, it's really costly. We have to shut down for about two hours every day. It costs us somewhere between 75,000 and 100,000 per year uh, to clean out our um, uh, equipment. Um, and it's a, a, a pretty big safety issue. Not only do our people have to actually jump inside our machines when they're shut down to cut the material out, but plastic bags are made out of petroleum. So when they wrap around that equipment and they're still running, it creates friction and they can actually light up um, and, and spark a fire. Again, another concern when you're running as much paper and uh, paper products as we are. Um, the, the last thing is that is what the third thing that makes the recycling work is that somebody can buy it. Um, there are just no viable markets out there um, the really low market value for uh, plastic bag material in the first place. But once it runs through our facility, by the time um, it even hits our facility, it's so dirty, it's pretty banged up. What the end market, the end markets who do exist out there want that clean stuff that, so if you have a plastic bag, make sure you're taking it back to like the Target, Home Depot, Walmarts where they have plastic bag returns because once it gets to our facility, it's too dirty. They don't want it. So the amount of money that it costs us to pull it out of our system and processes and bag it up, bail it and get it to the end market is um, like a tenth, a tenth of what um, or they're willing to pay end markets are willing to pay us about a tenth of what it actually costs. So there's just, it doesn't make economical sense for folks like us to do that work. Um, so, you know, we always, we will always advocate for reuse. Um, refuse the bag when possible, use a, um, uh, a reusable bag, canvas reusable bag. Um, and um, the uh, 
Attorney General uh, Keith Ellison was just out here a couple of weeks ago. Um, and if you, I'll, I'll share some, um, and I'll put these in the chat, but I have a couple um, links for you guys to, to look at after this. Um, so as soon as I stop sharing my screen, I'll put this in the chat for you guys, but the Attorney General is out here. He's actually uh, suing Walmart and Reynolds, who owns um, uh, the plastic, bag it's a glad bags yep glad um because they're selling a bag on the market that says it's a recycling bag um and when no one in minnesota can take recycling uh, no one in minnesota can take plastic bags it's that big of an issue that um so we're the second or third state to actually have a lawsuit against corporations because of plastic bags. And I think that there will be several other states to follow suit. So if you see those bags on the market, um, don't buy them. We cannot accept them. If you put bags, if you buy or if you put recyclable material into a plastic bag, it will go into the trash, unfortunately. Um, so let me show you a little bit of the process and you'll kind of understand a little bit more about why. Uh, this happens. So the first stage, and I'm going to hope that you can also hear sound on this. I'll, I'm going to start it here in a second, but I'll let you know what you're seeing here is our pre-sort house. So this is where we're trying to get out as much plastic as possible. Um, what we're doing here is a process called negative sort. So they're trying to pull out everything that we do not want to continue on down the line. So your anything that we saw in that uh, contamination screen, um, uh, scrap metal, plastic bags, garden hoses, anything that's a tangler, anything that should not continue on the process because it either isn't recyclable, uh, potentially harmful for our folks or our equipment. That's what they're what these guys are doing here. Oh, it didn't play. There we go. You can see this material is pulled pretty quickly. Um, Kind of flows like a river. We've got several people who work on the line. I'm going to show you a couple here today, but you can see how much material there was left. And that right there, how he pulled that big uh, black bag off, you can tell that there was material in there. Um, you, we don't know what's inside those plastic bags, um, and so we definitely don't want for a safety and health. <coughs> hazards for our team. We don't want them opening up those bags. We have no idea what's in there. Um, and then you can see how quickly this material is running through our facility. Um, they also just don't have the time. Um, at the end of once you've seen all of the processes, you'll see there's just not another second or minute in our process where there's another process can be added. Um, and so we're trying to bake this as effective and efficient as possible, um, adding an additional process. Um, adds more time, adds more money. And at the end of the day, we just don't recoup, recoup that money. So here is where uh, our biggest challenge really occurs with um, plastic bags. So I'm gonna, um, before I play it, I wanna show you that these are those discs I was talking about. They rotate, everything that is two dimensional will float on top of that. In the spaces between those discs is where we want the three-dimensional, the bottles, the smaller objects, we want those things to fall. You can see already right here at the front of these, there's stuff wrapped around those discs. That's all plastic bags. So I'm gonna play this and you can see what happens. Um, you can see there's already enough material here that causes those two-dimensional products not to be able to fall through. They end up traveling with the paper and they contaminate our paper line, um, making them not recyclable. You can see that milk jug that just floated off and over. That's because it had nowhere to go. I'm going to replay that one more time so you guys can really get a, a, a visual of that. That milk jug right there. That milk jug right there. There's so much wrapped around our equipment right now. This is right. I, I made sure to take this video right before we're, we're stopping to clean to clean the equipment. Things can then not fall through the cracks that cannot be collected to recycle and it cannot, and then it ends up contaminating other lines. So that's why that's really important. Here's another view of that. And this one doesn't have sound. But what we're trying to do is separate that two dimensional stuff. So this is our cardboard waterfall. When paper gets into that line, 
or when plastic gets into that line, it contaminates our cardboard and our paper. So this is just a little bit of a quick view of um, our paper line there. That's so cool to see, Katie. And just so you're aware, um, if five minute time check, if possible, I know you got off to such a late start. Yeah, okay, I will rush. Okay, I'm gonna, this is essentially the same thing. So I'm just gonna skip by that one. Um, and this is a, a quick video showing you um, people actually getting into those machines, cutting out all of that plastic that is wrapped around those discs. So this costs us two to four hours every single day. Um, so we, so kind of getting off the, the uh, plastic bag, um, I'll give you a really quick view of what uh, the rest of our machine looks like. We do have some uh, robots who are sorting and cleaning up paper lines so these guys are um, trying to pull out anything that is not paper, uh, so there's plastic, trash, I mean, those big, big, thick pieces of cardboard. You'll still see brown paper in here, but the big pieces of cardboard we're trying to get out. Here's our main sort house. Um, this area is where most of the um, material is uh, sorted. So we're doing what's called a positive sort in here. So we're trying to pull out everything that we want to keep that is recyclable. And then just a quick view of all of the processes that are going on around there. This is our optical sorter. This uh, really cool piece of technology is um, using an, uh, re an infrared piece of like laser light that's reading the material and then sending puffs of air to the material that we want to keep. So this is reading uh, number one PET and number five polypropylene. So I'll play that real quick and you'll see how those specific items, there's a puff of air that's coming and pushing that up and over into a different bin. Everything else is falling down. So this is a good reminder for those of you who might drink half a soda, half a, uh, if you're, make sure to dump that out. I'm sure you guys remember this because you're telling your kids to uh, dump out your milk jugs. Um, same principle, before you put the cap back on, dump it out because if it's just using a puff of air, it might be too heavy. Um, I'll show you a quick uh, view of our eddy current here. Uh, kind of the same principle, but instead it's using um, the polarity of um, magnets to repel aluminum cans into a different bin. So this is a really cool piece of technology that's kind of um, fun to see, but you can also see because some things get pushed and propelled, it'll sometimes carry other materials. So it's not always perfect. So we try to remind people that when like uh, to do the best that they can, like removing plastic bags out because that adds an additional complexity. So it's already not perfect. So anything added in that uh, dam um, damages our process is uh, good to know. I'm going to skip through that. And then, um, but we do have uh, steel and tin magnets, um, and then we process uh, glass also at our facility. Um, and then our residual or end of the line, um, this is the material that does not make it into um, the recycling. Uh, this is either trash, it's too small to be collected, um, or uh, it is not capturable by our our, our material, so things like black plastic are not is not capturable. Uh, Eureka's re residual weight hovers around 10%. Minnesota has an 85-15 rule, so um, if we were to get to that 15%, um, percent, we are taxed differently and at much different rate and um, at the same rate as trash. So it's really important for us to get as clean a material as possible. Um, uh, so just to give you um, my last couple of minutes or my last minute, uh, uh, I'd like to give everyone security and knowing that the material in uh, Minnesota actually does get recycled. Um, and we think really conscientiously about where our material goes. 75% of our material stays right here in Minnesota, 85% of it in the Northwest, and 99% of it 
um, in, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, in the Midwest, and then 99% of it in um, North America. So we do, um, we had a really small, like under 1% um, this first year, it was the first year we've had to do that. So um, number one PET gets turned into uh, back into beverage bottles, recyclable food containers, uh, and some carpeting uh, that goes to Wisconsin, Illinois, and Georgia. Our number two uh, HDPE goes back into bottles. It goes into durable decking, fencing, patio furniture, irrigation, um, and that's in Minnesota, Michigan, and Illinois. Um, our mixed material uh, cartons um, facilities in Wisconsin, Missouri, and Iowa turns into tissue, uh, paper towels, insulation, and other post-consumer recyclable building material. Um, and aluminum goes back into aluminum. Um, it can be foil, it can be cans, and, it, um, and sometimes uh, go with plastic wrapping. So this, for the most part, goes to Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Kentucky. Um, and last, um, our paper, for the most part, stays right here in uh, Minnesota, uh, goes to West Rock Paper Mill. Um, and it, from the time you guys put it into your recycle bin to the time it comes to us, gets turned back into paper or cardboard, gets back to the general mills of the world to make you know, your next Cheerio box and back on the shelf is about a six week process. So it's really a really great um, um, cycle here in the, the Twin Cities. Uh, and then number five, uh, polypropylene, your tubs and lids gets paint cans, car parts, other durable plastic goods. Um, and those facilities are in Alabama, Missouri and Canada. So we know exactly where things are going. So you, um, if you live here in the state of Minnesota, um, definitely have confidence that your material is being recycled. And um, we're thinking always about the, the highest and best use of those um, so they can be used over and over and over again. Um, that's my presentation. So if anyone has questions, there's a couple ways uh, you can get your questions answered. Um, you can go to our website. We have a whole host of resources on there. Um, and if you have a very specific question, you can an email um, engagement at eurekarecycling.org. Uh, we have a whole team of folks who um, uh, do recycling education and will respond back to you. But uh, there's someone on the end of this um, email who will triage that and get you the right person and get you the right answer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. This is so helpful to see, I think, from a recycling facility perspective, like why can't plastic bags go in the recycling dumpster? So thanks for all the great visuals and videos. This is awesome. Uh, and we'll jump in. So next we have Dan Miller. Uh, Dan currently serves as the director of operations for Farmington Area Public Schools. He oversees all buildings and grounds, staff and operations, district health and safety, construction management, and other miscellaneous duties under the direction of the superintendent. He's been in his current role since July of 2017. And prior to that, he started his career in education as a middle school life science teacher in Lakeville at what was then Kenwood Trail. Um, after obtaining his master's degree in learning technology, he transitioned to the role of technology coordinator at uh, the newly opened Century Junior High in Lakeville. And transitioned to Farmington Public Schools as a middle school assistant principal after leaving teaching in 2005. After working with that administrative team through the construction of the new Farmington High School, uh, Dan became principal of Bachman Middle School in 2012, where he, which had previously been the high school site. And Dan continued in the role of building principal until accepting his current job as director of operations. So take it away, Dan, and you can share your screen. All right, sounds good. Well, thanks, Allie. Uh, let's see if we can make this go here. Oops, wrong. See Looks here, great. You got Looks it? Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, sounds good. Well, um, I will try to be brief. Um, Katie obviously had quite a bit of uh, information and some uh, pretty neat things to see there in terms of how the recycling aspect all works. Um, and so, um, for those of you out there, um, Ali had asked uh, a little bit um, about how we uh, try to support that uh, specifically in terms of that bag risk, bagless recycling component. Um, so here in Farmington, we've been doing that for at least a couple of years. Um, at, uh, with COVID, a lot of things start to blend together here in the last few years. 
Um, and so um, she asked if I would kind of just speak to um, kind of how we go about things and successes, challenges, um, tips, tricks, insight, so on and so forth. So I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to try to go through this a little bit quickly. Um, did that advance, Ellie, or no? Uh, not yet. Sometimes it takes a little second. Maybe try clicking it one more time. It's not working yet. Hold on. Great. Why is it not going? <laughs> we could definitely see it. You're just getting the first screen? Yep. Oh, shoot. And I can share too if it's helpful, Dan. If you got it, go ahead. Does that be better? Okay. That's fine if you've got it pulled up. Yeah, no worries. Okay, I'll share right now. Unless did it go okay. now? Oh, I probably stopped then. I bet it's. I got mine up if, if that works. Okay. okay. Can you That's see fine. it? Yep. Okay. Um, go ahead, Joe. So uh, I just wanted to start off with, um, as Ali mentioned before, you know, the primary piece with bagless recycling, and as Katie reiterated uh, just a minute ago, is is the key aspect is keeping the bag keeping the bags out of. The dumpsters so they don't get uh you know off to the processing you know facilities so um i just grabbed a few photos um of dumpsters here at a number of our sites just to give folks an idea as to you know what you might happen to see uh, granted it's in the summer so some of our stuff is a little emptier than it normally might be um but you know one of the concerns oftentimes that people have is okay well if you don't put it in bags you know what's the risk of uh you know things happening stuff blowing out um, you know, so on and so forth. So one of the things that I think we've learned over time is operationally, if if and when possible, um, you can see here in a couple of the photos, um, leverage the materials that you have access to, to keep stuff in your dumpsters. Uh, so you'll see in two of those there that we've kind of stacked uh, cardboard on top of those items that are perhaps a, a little bit more uh, likely uh, to catch a wind and potentially blow out loose paper uh, and lighter objects. It's not to say that this is still perfect and foolproof, um, but it would be, you know, my impression, my opinion, my experience that, uh, you know, items, loose items blowing out of containers um, is not really a significant challenge. Uh, you know, when I walk through a loading dock area, there might be an occasion where I find a loose scrap of paper, so on and so forth, but it, it's it's not a significant issue. Um, and I will tell you firsthand that uh, with where uh, we are located in southern Minnesota, um, across from some very large fields that the wind coming from the west has plenty of opportunity to uh, whip up and grab stuff that this it, that that is not really a, a significant um a challenge for us. So you'll see this in a lot of our dumpsters where people will stack larger uh, recyclable. They'll set the cardboard aside uh, and then throw that on top, uh, you know, as the dumpster gets a little bit more full to, to try to lock out that wind a little bit. And you can see that there's lids and so on and so forth on some of these as well, um, uh, which can help once again, if the wind doesn't whip them open. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's definitely one, um, one opportunity or, or uh, one thing to try to help uh, resolve that that potential challenge or, or concern that folks have. Do you want to jump to the next one, Allie? Uh, and then I just wanted to kind of, because Allie stressed this as well, um, you know, the, the, the key piece here with bagless is the outdoor dumpsters. Um, if you walk around our facilities, you will see that the vast, vast majority of our containers in, you know, common spaces, cafeterias, hallways, uh, you know, gyms, so on and so forth, as well as the smaller containers and offices and kind of more, you know, classrooms, uh, smaller spaces, most all of them, you know, in the recycling, they still have liners in them uh, for lots of different reasons. In most cases, it's just for cleanliness, yeah, ease of maintenance, uh, you know, if something spills, tips, whatever it happens to be, um, that they can, you know, isolate that to the liner um, and not necessarily need to, you know, wipe out, clean out, spray out, uh, a, a, you know, a waste container. Um, they would then, if you want to jump to the next one, Allie, we can move through this here quick. Um, our collection piece, um, you know, as it pertains to our custodial staff, 
uh, even those bag or those uh, bagged or lined uh, containers, um, they all get dumped into uh, a larger barrel um, that's managed by our custodial staff. Uh, so we kind of use them as the buffer in terms of trying to make sure that bags don't get into our large dumpsters outside. Uh, so even though most of our, you know, kind of location specific containers do have liners, um, like I mentioned, to lessen the, the kind of the operational aspect of having to clean those out. Um, our custodians will use, you know, 44s, 55 gallon, um, you know, recycling barrels to empty recycling into, um, you know, as they're collecting it, uh, they don't always change out the liners, uh, you know, on a day to day basis, they kind of use their judgment in terms of, you know, how soiled those might be uh, as they're picking them up. Uh, and it also varies a little bit within in house in district here in terms of whether or not um, our staff line uh, the large collection barrels or not. I'd say we're about 50 50 uh, here in our district in terms of whether or not people are, are utilizing a liner uh, in the recycling uh, barrel uh, as they're emptying into those. Uh, and to be quite honest, that kind of depends on the facility itself. Um, uh, some some of our facilities have very easy access uh, and local access um, to you know slop sinks and hoses and so on and so forth, uh, and those buildings that uh, have access to that um, in that location where they're oftentimes dumping uh, the barrels into uh, the large dumpsters, then if they get soiled, they've got easy access and they just spray them out. But uh, that's more in our secondary sites and some of our newer, larger elementary buildings. Uh, but oftentimes um, our smaller or elementary or older sites that may not have quite the same uh, resources, they will oftentimes put a liner in the barrel uh, and then they just they just dump the barrel in, uh, leaving the liner in the barrel. Um, so as they as they go ahead and do that and um, it hasn't been an issue either way. Um, it's kind of what works for people. It just obviously the end objective is that, you know, none of the liners from the smaller containers in the building uh, go in the in the uh, large barrels and then the liners uh, if if they're using liners in the large barrels that those don't go in the uh, the large recycling uh, dumpsters outside either so um, it seems to have worked well um, you know uh, something that people have just gotten used to um, you know to the best of my knowledge or ability in talking with our staff uh, it hasn't necessarily created any additional you know work or obstacles um, you know for them you know does stuff get wet in there from time to time um, yes, uh, you know, if somebody dumps a, a full container of, of you know, uh, in, in a beverage bottle uh, into the recycling um, and you've got paper and stuff like that, does it potentially get wet? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of single sort, though. So um, it just kind of is what it is. Um, and as Katie showed, uh, you know, there's some pretty spectacular equipment that's out there to be able to sort, you know, sort through and still, you know, make use of that material, um, you know, to the best of best of our ability. But in terms of bag lists, it's worked well for us. Um, haven't had really any, uh, you know, significant challenges with it. Um, hasn't been an issue. Um, just kind of one of those things that, you know, people kind of just get used to um, as time goes on in terms of a, of a new process. So that's what I've got. I know we're running short on time, so I'll leave it there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. And his contact information is here. If anyone has additional questions for him, we do have several districts in our county um, that are gone bagless, and I know um, several districts that still need to. So um, this is just kind of where we are in the journey. And I really appreciate you sharing your insight, Dan. I think a lot of those ideas when we were talking are just like, oh, being strategic and how you load the recycling, genius. Like that is really helpful. So we appreciate that. Uh, and I know we are running behind. So I had a whole presentation on other things related to bag lists that I'm gonna whip through in five minutes so that I can still give Christy and Matt, our next two presenters, enough time. Um, so they'll have from hopefully 11.10-ish to uh, 11.30 and then I'll do my resources in the last five minutes because everyone hears the resources every year and you can find them all on the website. So not to fear, we can do this. So I'm gonna share my screen and jump in. So I'm gonna just share the highlights. And if somebody really is out there struggling with bagless recycling in the dumpster, please reach out to me because there's a lot more information that I'm gonna say. Um, but several years ago, we were providing guidance to schools that a few large clear bags in the recycling dumpster was okay. Things have changed. Katie did a great job allowing us to be able to see why bag 
recyclables can't go in the dumpster for recycling. And it's great to learn from Dan and how his district does this successfully because we don't want to overwhelm sorters and damage and jam equipment at the recycling facilities. Um, plastic bags are on our designated list of contaminants in Dakota County. They haven't been allowed in the recycling dumpster since 2021. So um, they need to be loose. Uh, keep food and liquids out of recycling. Ensure bottles, cans, cartons are empty um, because we know contaminates recyclables. And like Katie showed, it's not gonna be able to get through on that puff of air if it's heavy. Um, we also know liquids creates very heavy, messy bags, um, which causes worker safety lifting issues as well for our custodial staff. Um, and contamination, it's a new fee we're seeing from haulers in recent years for bagged recyclables and unaccepted items. So avoid the bag, avoid those fees. Um, outside of the cafeteria, the other major area where a large quantity of liquids are generated is breakfast in the classroom programs due to the large number of milk cartons. So um, we need to be collecting uh, those milk cartons. So we need to have a solution for liquids. Um, so these are a few models that some schools have used um, in the hallway for collection. Other schools have asked students to use classroom containers, which might require them using a classroom sink. If that's allowed at your school, we know there's some challenges with some of the sink infrastructure. So making sure you have a space to dump liquids, which is really important as breakfast and lunch will be no charge to students beginning this year in the state of Minnesota. So if breakfast is served outside the cafeteria, we need a way to capture the liquids. So the milk cartons can be captured for recycling. And I'm happy to provide any additional tips to schools on that. There's also a pour way company I'm aware of that has liquid collection bins, which are pretty cool. They're kind of innovative and new. So for here, do what, you, do what works for you. Um, obviously, if it's ideal to not have any bags in the recycling containers to save money and resources, but um, if you need to line all containers, do it. If it's possible to eliminate liners in all areas that aren't getting um, that liquid waste, that is better. Um, maybe just lining cafeteria containers and hallway spaces. Um, but regardless, when you are bringing them into the process at the end, you need to keep the bags out of the recycling. And there's different methods for collection. Um, let's talk more if you need input on this. Um, because this is very specific to custodial staff, but uh, collecting with barrels on tandem dollies, or you know, are we throwing the bag and then um, holding on to the bottom and reusing the bag, or how are we emptying containers? Um, overall goal: just make sure it's loose in the dumpster or cart for recycling. Dumpster lids. So with loose recyclables, having a lidded container is essential. Um, there's lots of different lids offered by haulers. So there's a dumpster prop tool. My recommendation to avoid that um, and having to use that every day would just be assisted dumpster lids from your hauler, which stay open on their own. You can see on the left, there's a metal assisted lid. On the right, there's a flimsy plastic lid. Don't go with the flimsy plastic lid and have to keep it open all the time. And now things blew out. Do the metal assisted lid. Um, your hauler should be able to provide that to you. Um, and don't leave them open all the time either because that just creates issues um, from rain and other things, just contaminating your recyclables potentially. So a little bit of liquids is okay, but we really wanna make sure that we have lids on those recycling containers. There are cart lifters, um, several schools with these pictures on the right are from District 197. They've implemented bagless district-wide as well. And all schools have the toter lifter as part of their custodial safety practices. Um, so they're using that toter um, and with a liner to collect recyclables, and then they reuse the liner after they dump it. Um, you could use rubber bands, um, an old bike like inner tube, or um, I've seen bungee cords to prevent that bag from falling into the dumpster. There's a few different cart tipper systems. We just piloted this system um, at Tilden Community Center and Hastings School District. Um, it seemed to work great with their trash dumpster, but the style of the taller recycling dumpster was a little too high. So Hastings requested a shorter recycling dumpster at this location from their hauler and it's now working well. So if anyone like more information on this manual way cheaper lift, um, please let me know. This is eligible in our grant program, as well as information on barrel washing systems. Um, so there's a lot of different models for those if that's something that you need in your school to eliminate maybe plastic bags and save you money and resources on those. Um, 
Really quickly, students at Lincoln Public School District in Lincoln, Nebraska have a mesh bag that they, it's a reusable mesh bag liner. Um, they actually line their um, container so that when students empty their, you know, they dump their liquids out and they put their cartons in the container. Um, any residual milk is able to drain to the bottom outside of the mesh bag and it just keeps their recycling dumpster cleaner. Um, obviously you have to clean these bags in the washing machine or somewhere else, but um, you can use it over and over again. And you could also just line if you wanted to prevent having to wash the container um, with a plastic bag on the inside too. So that's another innovative solution, but cartons need to be loose um, when they're going in the recycling dumpster. And just to mention, there are you know, bags on the state contract that are recycled content. So if you are gonna be using bags, look at those um, and check those out so you can at least be having a little bit of a greener option. So wrapping up, there's several challenges to going bagless. You know, we've heard um, figuring out how you're gonna dump loose, um, getting used to your new system, the height of the dumpster might need to change to allow staff to um, you know, hang on to that bag and then pull it back out. If you're dumping with the bag, Alliance Education Center asked for a lower opening and that worked well for them. Litter, I think this is really interesting. Um, so just knowing like if a dumpster is in your facility and the hauler is emptying the dumpster, that seems to be when the litter is blowing out the most. Um, so it's your responsibility uh, when it's on site, but when it's, you know, when they're emptying the container, work with your hauler on potential solutions. Um, if it's happening frequently, I did talk to our waste regulation unit and um, they can work with us too to develop some solutions as well. Um, it is in our ordinance that haulers are responsible for damage or spillage when collecting materials, but we need as a school to do our part to set them up for success before pickup. So is your dumpster full or overflowing? Is that causing items to blow out? Are our lids closed? Um, how are we loading our materials? Smaller stuff first, cardboard on top. There's different ways to engineer solutions as well um, to prevent that recyclable material from blowing. So we can talk more about that. There are more ideas. And then liquids as well, um, you know, different solutions we've talked about, um, either with the mesh bags or just making sure that you know that the hauler has the ability to give you fresh dumpsters and what is talking to your hauler about what the frequency is that they can give you cleaning or a new dumpster to address that. Um, lastly, that last picture you'll see um, shows a school that lined, you know, the, the card on the bottom, they actually, um, use that container for students. So this is a time saver um, at Oak Ridge Elementary. Students empty their recycling containers from the classroom into that shared cart. And then custodial staff only has to empty the cart. They don't have to go classroom to classroom for the recycling, only for the trash. So that's another solution where it also got students involved in the process. And we can do all of these things, uh, save money on bags, reduce hauler contamination fees, um, staff safety, you can read that list. Um, and overall, just helping our recycling market stay strong and avoiding um, that contamination um, and working with our haulers and with us as the county if you need solutions. So um, let's keep working together. No plastic bags in our recycling dumpsters and keep our food and liquids out. Um, so feel free to reach out to me if you need more brainstorm um, or problem solve. And I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, Christy Otterson. So Christy Otterson's worked for Dakota County in the Waste Regulation Unit for over 10 years and is the current Dakota County Household Hazardous Waste Program Manager. Prior to this, Christy worked at various other public and private sector industries and has over 25 years in waste industry experience. So take it away, Christy. Rapid fire. We're, we have too much information. We have so many good questions. This is exciting stuff, oh. but I hope no one else is feeling like, whoa, where are we? Because <laughs> we can always talk more. That's why we have information on the end of our slides. One moment. I just closed my PowerPoint. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. For sure. And I have it too, if you need it, Christy. Okay. 
Great. You can see it. Yep. All right. And feel free to go till 1130. Like I will fly through that last part. So we want to give you the 15 minutes at least um, because you and Matt have some exciting stuff to share. All right. Well, we'll, we'll zip through as, as reasonably fast as we can. Yeah. So hi, everybody. I'm Christy Otterson, and I appreciate joining your workshop today to share some information on the new vape disposal program that rolled out this past spring in Dakota County. So this is just a quick overview. Dakota County Environmental Resources and Public Health partnered together to develop a program that would help schools properly dispose of vaping devices and e-cigarettes. Here's just an overview of what we'll be covering. And I'm gonna start basically with the most important thing as to why we needed this program. So vaping devices are a regulated hazardous waste and cannot go in the trash or recycling. Federal, state, county regulations require electronic smoking devices be properly managed to prevent both fires and exposure to toxic substances. So improper disposal can pose a threat to human health and the environment. Nicotine is a regulated hazardous waste and is highly toxic. Nicotine can be absorbed directly through your skin. And then the lithium batteries within these devices are highly flammable and can release a toxic gas when damaged. A damaged battery can cause a heat reaction that can reach temperatures of more than 500 degrees very, very quickly. So in Dakota County, most of our trash goes to a landfill in Burnsville or Invergrove Heights, and our recycling goes to one of several recycling sorting facilities. Fires at these facilities and in collection trucks are a great concern and have become more common due to the lithium batteries. 95% of the Dakota County drinking water comes from groundwater. So e-cigarettes contain heavy metals and when leached into soil or waterways can cause damage to our water supplies. So we need to properly manage vape devices, keep them out of the trash and recycling so they don't become one of part of the 150 million vape devices that are thrown away in the United States every single year. So there's many different types of e-cigarettes. The top in image actually shows the various stages and updated products that have evolved over the years. Um, the two shown on the bottom, which is a Loon Max and an Elf Bar are the most common types you'll see in schools and used by students today. All of the devices that are shown here are accepted through our vape device program. So in the spring of 2020, Dakota County sent out a survey to all the schools regarding their current storage disposal practices. We had 33 responses, probably the most um, amazing response we had was that we crushed them with a hammer and we dispose of them in the dumpster. So all of these responses led us to the vape disposal program for schools that again, we developed through our environmental resources and our public health department. So earlier this year, we had virtual meetings with all public schools and interested non-public charter and private schools to explain this new program and the resources that were available to them. All school districts and two non-public schools are participating in the program. 47 kits were distributed to schools and the kit comes with a pre-labeled latching metal box, as you can see in this image. It's labeled on both sides. One label is an instruction label that complements the instruction printed guide, as you can see there. And the other label that's displayed is the hazardous waste label. Uh, it's labeled as hazardous waste because it is hazardous for both nicotine and the lithium batteries. The other items that are needed for the program are gloves and sealable bags like a sandwich bag, and the bags are only used when you have leaking devices. The vape disposal kit provides schools with a metal container where the vape devices can be safely stored and minimize the potential for fire. Fire potential comes from two different things. One, if the button on the vape device is depressed, it could 
heat up and potentially start a fire. Or if the lithium battery within the device is damaged, that too could cause a fire. So there's a protective material in the box. As you can see in this image, there's kind of a gray medium in there. This is called cell block. It will melt and suffocate a fire if, heated, if, a, if there is for some reason that it would heat up. When not in use, the box should be secured and then locked away. So inside the box under the lid is a simple tracking form. This form is used to track each time a device is placed in the box. And this information is used when scheduling an appointment for disposal. Tracking this information is useful for both evaluating the success of the program and for us to understand the amount of vaping devices being confiscated and disposed of in schools. So when a box is full and at the end of the school year, an appointment is scheduled to bring the vape devices to the recycling zone through our VSQG or small business program. There is no fee for disposal. The household hazardous waste program will cover the cost for disposal since it's been decided to accept these devices from schools as household hazardous waste. This was done to reduce the financial burden on schools and to help get these items out of the trash and recycling. The school representative will bring the box to the recycling zone at a scheduled an appointment and the box will be emptied, additional cell block will be added as needed, and then you'll leave with the box for continued use. To date, there have been six schools that have brought in 280 vape devices to the recycling zone for proper disposal. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Matt Drug, who has participated in this program. Matt has been one of Matt has been one of the assistant principals at Simley High School since 2021. Prior to joining the independent school district in 19 or in District 199, Matt was a dean of students for two years in Burnsville School District and a special education teacher in Rosemount Egan Apple Valley School District. He has a passion for supporting students through a tough situation and enjoys building collaborative supports with students and families to change outcomes. He currently lives in Invergrove Heights, Minnesota with his wife, Mallory, and two sons, Mason and Miles. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me today. Just wanted to take time to show off my fancy box uh, that I was able to get this spring. Um, the way that we really came into this is we participate in a grant called the Positive Community Norms Grant. And through that partnership um, with that grant, we've really been trying to figure out ways to address the vaping within our building. Um, and as everyone who's been working in a school administration knows over the last several years, the, uh, the amount of these devices that we collect seems to grow uh, day by day and year by year. Um, we were definitely that school uh, last year that when we would confiscate one, we would hold on to it long enough for a reentry meeting or a meeting with the student and the family, and then they typically went into the trash. Um, so this was a much needed um, opportunity for us to figure out a better way to go about disposing of, of these hazardous materials. Um, my personal experience with it is this has been extremely, extremely helpful. Um, it gives us a designated space to hold on to the items. Um, one thing that we were starting to find as we were trying to get rid of these in a better way was uh, our school resource officer refused to start refused to take them for that same reason that we don't want them being thrown away as the fire hazard that have then um, left for them either in their office or back at the um, police department. Um, and so this really solved a huge hole for us um, and has really worked very seamlessly with our practices. So um, we work in connection with our middle school and I collect all of the devices that we either take here at our building at Simley or at Invergrove Heights Middle School. Um, my experience was, like I said, really slick and easy for anyone looking to, to sign up and do this. It was very much just call, set the appointment, um, and that appointment took us maybe five minutes from start to, to, to end. Um, if anyone's had any experience using the, the recycling center, sometimes you get there and there's quite a line and you end up waiting for a while. That was not this experience um, for me at all. Um, and for us, like I said, it, it filled a huge hole about doing what was right with these uh, materials and um, you know, feeling good about a, a nice way to dispose of hundreds of vapes of over time. So 
Um, I, I can't recommend this program enough. Thanks for sharing, Matt. And it was because you got to make an appointment through the business program, right, for drop off that you didn't even have to come at a time when the public was there, which is awesome. Great. So when thinking about your school, these are some things I'd like some questions that I would like you to ponder. So what happens when a vape device is confiscated or found in your school? These are just questions for you to think about and answer. Who is involved? Is it the principal, school resource officer, other school or district personnel? Where and or how are vape devices stored in your school? And how are they disposed of? So answering these questions will help you and your school to have a known process in place to ensure that all the vape devices are collected and kept out of trash and recycling in your school. Here's some frequently asked questions that we've received about the program. So should the battery be removed? No, it can be dangerous to remove the battery. We've explored this. We just say, leave the battery inside. The whole vape device will be, will be managed through our hazardous waste disposal contractor. What should you do with THC? Obviously, this is a current question for everybody. Unfortunately, it's a little bit um, difficult because federally, the rules are different than state. So vape devices containing THC still need to be brought to your local police department for disposal. And if you're unable to tell if it's nicotine or THC on it, put it in the vape disposal collection box and we will manage it. Who's allowed to transport these on behalf of a school to the recycling zone? A school designated staff person is allowed to transport these legally after making your appointment. So I have more questions regarding this and other items, hazardous waste items in my school. Who do I contact? So please feel free to reach out to the recycling zone at co.dakota.mn.us. Just include your school name and throw your question in and we get back to you as soon as we can. So thank you for your time today. There's more information on this program. Visit www.dakotacounty.us, search vape disposal. You can find our vape disposal handout, our training video that's online and the student vape presentation education information. And with that, we're gonna pull up a poll, last poll of the day. Thank you, Christy and Matt. So the poll question is, before this presentation, were you aware a vape disposal program existed for Dakota County Schools? And Christy, myself, as well as um, someone in public health department were behind meeting with all the public school districts on this program and offering it to them. And all school districts, as well as two non-public schools are participating which is so exciting. All right, 84%, I think. Let's see what we got. So 88% did not know about this program. So I'm so glad we were sharing this with you today and Christy and Matt were able to share about this vape device disposal program. And if, you know, if your school is not participating, um, to your knowledge, they may be participating not to your knowledge. So feel free to ask um, an administrator or someone in your school about that. Um, we did really promote it to secondary schools, so focus on middle and high schools. And then districts were getting the few vapes found from the elementaries to those schools that have the collection box. So we're not storing it as a fire hazard in a dust drawer somewhere. Um, so thank you so much. And our last presentation, that's why this goes till 1135, right? We still got five minutes. So we can we can make it through our resources because I know we're all really up to date on all the Dakota County resources because why wouldn't this be the website that's your homepage? So all our resources today that I wanted to share with you are here, but there may be more I'm not talking about. So just go to dakotacounty.us, search school recycling. We have free labels, posters, activity guides. These are available through an online order form to you. 
And as we know, all containers are required to be labeled. So if you have containers in your school that are not labeled, you can get free labels by ordering them. And um, if you need more assistance, if it's, oh, all our containers aren't labeled and, oh, actually we don't have any recycling containers next to every trash, then maybe it's time to apply for the grant program and get assistance with that. But we do have resources for you and that's mailed to your school for free. We have some best practice guides. Um, these are available for custodial food service classrooms and wasted food prevention on our website. School training resources I talked about a little bit at uh, when we were talking about food scraps collection, but all schools in Dakota County are now required to provide standardized recycling education at least once a year to every student, employee, um, custodial, food service staff. And so we have resources to do that. And that's linked here. So you'll have these slides afterwards. Um, so meet, use, our, use our materials to meet those requirements. Um, we have a lot of great stuff and then we would love to hear from you. What else you would like us to create? And that applies for organics as well as we talked about earlier for areas where you have organics and who is working in those areas. Cafeteria banners are available for free by request for liquids, recycling, trash, organics. Um, ones we've made in the past are two feet by three feet, but um, if your school's interested in better signage and the sizing doesn't work, just let me know, we can work with you. Whoa, uh, a new contactless online checkout systems available for portable containers and education kits. Um, that's available on our webpage, available here. So if you need just outdoor containers for an event, you have a few extra brutes you're bringing out, maybe for a fair or an outdoor festival, please use our containers. Ensure that every trash is paired with recycling, no matter if it's indoors or outdoors, um, as well as education kits. So check those out on our website. Free performances and field trip busing is available to, um, the performances are focused on grades K through three. They come to your school, do an in-school performance. Field trips, you can visit a recycling facility, landfill, or compost site. And more information on those are available on our webpage. Those are free. And we have our school waste prevention and recycling grant. We know nearly 80% of school waste is recycled or compostable. We want to be able to provide assistance to help schools reduce waste and recycle more. So we do have grants available to all public and private schools in Dakota County. Um, grants up to $10,000 per school per year based on different initiatives you may be working on. So first we need to make sure indoor recycling is up to snuff, then we can work on things like stadium recycling, food, wasted food prevention, reusables, um, green team initiatives are included with all grants. So um, please reach out on that. We have an e-news. If you're not already signed up, you can sign up on our website. It's sent four times a year on just things we're, we're doing or highlighting schools that are doing great work. We have a poster and video contest for fourth grade students um, for the poster contest and then five through 12 um, for the video contest. So we had two students from Cypress Classical Academy in Burnsville win our poster contest this year. And then students from Nicollet Middle School were our video contest winners. So get involved in that. Um, Dakota County provided free compost to you know, organics program participants for the third year this year again. And this year we doubled our participation. We had 20 schools request a total of 68 cubic yards of free compost. So if you have an organics program um, and you know, you're partnering with us in the past in some way, I am able to reach out to you and provide you with this compost um, that you can use in landscaping, gardens, turf or grass repair, et cetera. So that is available. And then we have some resources coming soon. And all this is available on our webpage, like I mentioned. It's a great resource to get started. It's also gonna be where our school workshop presentations will be posted uh, as they are finalized. And I'll send an email about that when they're available on the website. So we did it. We made it, 11.35 almost. So um, I just, a quick reminder that recycling is not sorted out of the trash. We learned all about different systems today with organics and recycling facilities. Um, once you're putting something in the trash, it's going to a landfill in Dakota County right now. We don't have processing available to us. There's no space or capacity at those processing facilities um, for schools. Um, even though technically public entity waste should be processed, 
Um, it is going to one of the two landfills, Burnsville or Invergrove Heights. So we really wanna make sure when something's going into the trash, it is true trash. Um, it's not sorted out afterwards. Um, so make sure it's true trash. And also if you're putting something in the recycling organics, make sure you know that that's where it goes so we can stay contamination free. So thanks so much for joining us at our you know, ninth annual workshop. Um, don't make the sloth work too hard. Keep recycling paired next to every trash container. And there's gonna be a two minute survey sent to you this week to get your feedback on future workshops. If you'd like CEU credits, please reach out to me. Um, again, there's three hours available through the Board of School Administrators and the School Nutrition Association. And this recording as well as the workshop presentations will be posted on our webpage in a week or so. And tour sign up information will be sent to you soon if you expressed you were interested in that. So if you have any questions, I will be sticking around. I'm happy to answer any questions um, until the last person's out of the virtual room. Uh, but thanks again for being here and have a great rest of your day, if not. Thanks everyone.